Yes, of course. Uh, Steinbrecher. Yes. Chen. Cisneros. Yes. Duran. De La Cruz. Yes. Manning. Yes. Fertula. Seleg. And I wanted to make a quick reminder to everyone, and I can hear the difference, uh, although it's not necessary for us to hear one another. Um, I understand that for the, the, whoever might be listening on the webcast and for the ar archive of the web webcast, I would encourage you to press the, bu to press the button uh, on the base of the microphone and uh, try to speak into the microphone when you're talking. All right, do we have a camera? We do. All right, so uh, call for public comment. I see no one in the room. Uh, is there anyone on the telephone who would like to, uh, as a member of the public, who would like to make a comment? All right, the next item on the agenda is an oral report. Uh, I have none other than to uh, you know, say that this is a meeting that follows a a previous meeting a while back where we had a, a very interesting presentation uh, about uh, how other organizations are uh, looking at and, and implementing um, uh, proactive uh, discipline uh, systems, which is something that this uh, committee has been charged with uh, considering. So I understand that we have uh, someone today to do that, but I'm going to turn the meeting over at this point to Mr. McLeod to, uh, to introduce our guest and to tell us uh, how you'd like to proceed today. Terrific. Thank you. Um, I, uh, just to recap very briefly, I, I, <coughs> I think uh, at the outset of the previous meeting in February, we uh, did an overview of where the task force has been. I hope that those of you who weren't in attendance had an opportunity to review the, um, the slide deck that uh, was made available in the Dropbox account. Um, there was some uncertainty with regard to how to proceed given um, how we've um, worked these task forces in the past, in particular having a very internal um, focus on the structures and uh, uh, composition of the, um, the state bar itself, of the Board of Trustees, its size, its membership. And um, we were, I think, struggling to get some traction. I feel like the February meeting is where we really um, – finally landed on a, a clear direction, and I think that the presentation from Professor Studdard in particular was, was super helpful in uh, uh, orienting us to what um, uh, evidence-based regulation might look like, preventative regulation. There are various different terms that we were tossing around at the time to, um, <coughs> to discuss what that might look like, and we were given a, a terrific um, overview of how evidence-based regulation is working in the medical profession. Um, so building on that, the goal for today is to take advantage of another comparative sp perspective. So um, I think in my methods courses in graduate school, what you would often talk about is like trying to hold everything constant except for maybe one thing. And then you would look at how things are different when you just change that one thing. So uh, with Professor Studdard, what we were looking at was a different industry or different profession. Now we have the same profession, but we have different countries. Um, and um, I'm... Uh, really excited to introduce Professor Tara Sklar, who um, uh, she is the a professor of health law, and she's the director of the health law and policy program at the University of Ari Arizona, um, where she oversees multidisciplinary online programs in health law. Um, if, if you're hearing some connection and some resonance between, wait a minute, did, didn't Professor Studdard do law and health as well? Um, I think what I would, if I were writing this up in a paper, I would say, what I, what I have here is a convenience sample, or perhaps a snowball sample, but um, that would simply be my way of trying to um, say I got very lucky in identifying a number of people who work in, in this field. I think it's a fairly small group of people, um, and they know one another, they know each other's work, and so uh, I think that that's partly also because we're, we're kind of on the leading edge here in terms of like um, looking at something that I is, is innovative and um, hasn't been done in other state bars. So um, I could go on about Professor Sklar, um, but I think rather than do that, I'll let her go on. I think she's got a terrific presentation. She, I shared with her an outline of where I think that we're headed with the, um, the, the report, which is what I will be reviewing later with you all and handing out. 
and she was kind enough to really orient her, her presentation to um, the outline of what I think the report will start to look like. So, <coughs> Professor Sklar? Oh, great, turn green. Good morning, uh, my name is Tara Sklar, and uh, feel, feel free to call me Tara. And uh, it's just such a pleasure to be here. Um, Dag's really given me such a warm introduction to what you're trying to do um, with the California State Bar, and I think it's just fantastic. Uh, I will, uh, I'm familiar with, David, with what Professor Stoddart presented to you a few weeks ago. I also do Hale from the University of Arizona, and you may have met a colleague of mine or heard about him, Christopher Robertson, um, in another context. And, uh, and, and I also made my slides quite uh, verbose, <laughs> more than usual, in an effort for you to look back upon after I leave today and also to help and support um, Dag as he prepares the final report. Um, I really hope to make this a very interactive process I don't, um, and, and, to, and continue to support you as you look at becoming more proactive uh, with your efforts. I loved how you started off the meeting with proactive um, efforts in this area. It's also been called predictive analytics, and then another really common term is risk-based regulation. I think that's probably the one I'm most familiar with, like really seems to address this topic going forward. And, um, and the other thing I might ask you to bear with me a little bit is that uh, the majority of this work took place between 2016 and 2018 in Australia, where I did work with David Stutter because um, he was previously based in Melbourne, Australia. And um, so that was a little while ago. And also terminology tends to differ between countries. So if at any point, something doesn't make sense because it's been two years, <laughs> or if I say something that um, there might be, I'm sure there's a different term used here in California, please feel free to clarify and, and let me know your thoughts on that. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to say is how exciting it is to do this when you often, when you do a study in a different country or jurisdiction, um, the opportunity to revisit it in a larger, more robust system is just it's quite unheard of. And so it's so exciting to have this opportunity to be with you today and, um, and apply what we learned in Australia to what you're trying to do here in California. Um, so the majority of what I'm gonna do over the next hour or so is probably present our findings in Australia. And um, I would love to share with you some of our lessons that we learned from, from that endeavor. And which really culminated in two studies that I'll go into a deep dive with. And then I'll propose some potential approaches for you. So for example, some things that we learned about in hindsight <laughs> was, you know, the focus tends to be on lawyers and bad lawyers and a trying early identification of um, before they become bad lawyers. But really, um, and Dak c c um, helped me with this term, complaining witnesses, or we just called complainants in Australia. Um, we, we would have done a lot more focus in that part of the study um, had, had we realized um, after the fact. Uh, so some things that would um, be helpful going forward, and also the um, coding process. <laughs> Very happy to share with you my coding. It was an incredibly time-intensive ordeal to work that out. And, um, and then certain things we just couldn't do in Australia because our data pool was not as large as yours, was looking at age and older age, um, particularly over 65 as lawyers continue to practice. There just wasn't enough of it in our population to look at that. So some things just to keep in mind where you automatically right off the bat differ from what we had in Australia and things that we learned. And then, um, and then I'd like to propose at the very end after I talk about our experience in Victoria, um, potential opportunities for you to um, explore and discuss um, and maybe perhaps pilot some interventions and, um, and then, you know, if, if that works, continue to uh, implement and have just have quality improvement. So uh, in 2016, we formed a research team that was comprised of about five different universities and then different disciplines within those universities. Uh, I was based at University of Melbourne at the time in the School of Population and Global Health. Um, and then we partnered with uh, New South Wales is the largest state in Australia, where the second largest, where Melbourne is in Victoria. Um, and we partnered with their law school, of course, David Stutter, who you've met over at Stanford. And, um, and then we had regulators involved, uh, particularly Ron Patterson, who used to be the health commissioner for uh, uh, New Zealand, now he's at the University of Auckland Law School. And uh, Martin Fletcher heads up um, our Australian Health Practitioner Database. <coughs> and then of course, as you would like in any um, <coughs> governance structure, a type of end user consumer advocate, which is uh, Jen Morris. And, and just as, as I really couldn't have asked for a lovelier <laughs> group of people to work with, such a diverse skill set, um, international, and, uh, and, 
and that's mainly who continues to work on this project with Australia going forward and, and may be um, useful people to tap upon um, as you go down your road looking at how to have more uh, evidence-based, data-driven regulation. So what, so what also tends to happen in Australia, so have any of you been to Australia? Not yet? One? Yeah? Um, it's not a particularly large country. It's about 23 million people, and then New Zealand's about 4.5 million. So often what happens when you only have three airlines is you end up meeting people, <laughs> the same people, whether you're in Qantas, Air New Zealand, or Virgin Australia. And that's exactly how this partnership got started. Uh, a board member for the uh, Victoria, Victoria Bar, essentially, was chatting with one of our team members, uh, uh, Marie Bismarck on the airplane, and she was saying, oh, we've done all this great work with all the health practitioners across Australia, of which there are 640,000 in, in this particular study window. And that includes this particular database is every health practitioner. It's doctors, nurses, midwives, anyone, chiropractor. And, um, and how excited she was because even though this is a huge number, how to regulate such a diverse, large group of people, when they actually looked at the complaints and disciplinary action, it whittled down to about 2 or 3% of that. And that got the board member for the um, state bar of Victoria thinking, well, maybe that would also apply to lawyers. And that was how this whole project got started, was on a, I don't know if it was Qantas or New Zealand, but basically two people sitting next to each other on an airplane. <laughs> And, um, and that was just an exciting area for us because um, this is a quote I used in our, our paper that was published, and I, and I often refer to it as there's an enormous amount of literature on a medical malpractice and how what happens to doctors, sometimes nurses, dentists, more of the health professions, and how they're regulating and trying to use empirical studies um, and work to look at their data. And then very little about lawyers, but yeah, particularly um, – uh, in law, you, it's, it's it, the, the same types of life or death consequences could occur, huge monetary losses if you do have poor legal performance. Yeah. I'm going to interrupt you to um, make a request from our call-in. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, the re request has been made for you to speak a little more into the microphone. Oh, sure. But I also think um, if you slow down a tiny bit, oh, that sure. might help also. Great. Thank you. I can also Sorry pause. No, no, I can. I'm happy to. If anyone has any questions or anything, uh, let me know. Okay, great. So, also in the introduction, where you may have noticed in my title, health law, certainly uh, Professor Studdard's position in medicine and law, a lot of overlap between, and then and then just the literature looking at other professions. We really are looking at how doctors are being disciplined because there's just there's such a wealth of knowledge there. And, um, but I also like to touch upon, is that better with the volume? Great. The very specific similarities between what happens with medicine and law, which you may also be familiar with, but maybe haven't thought about in this context, where you have a, an asymmetry of information, you have an expert with a great deal of information, and, and um, a client or patient who, who is reliant on that expert. When you go to the doctor or surgeon, you offer an often are going at a very vulnerable time in your life or for a loved one's life. And I think the exact same thing could be said for when you see a lawyer. It's an incredibly emotional time for many people. And for many people, it might be the first time they've ever encountered a lawyer or the law profession. Whereas in medicine, you grow up going to the doctor. It's not, um, the terrain isn't as uh, um, new, just to keep that in mind. And, uh, and the other thing is just how we're regulated in terms of its very estate-based focus. Um, there is licensing and board exams, and also there's a uh, how we do our oversight with complaints, uh, for better or worse, is how the professions also tend to be regulated. And then what's really fascinating, which got us all on the same page, is this frequent flyers or clustering of complaints. Um, and this is um, a... a just a photo of how this <laughs> appears, but it might be reassuring to you as you're thinking about the large body of lawyers that you're regulating in the state of California that um, only really a small handful in by comparison are ones that um, seem to be the, the real, uh, we need to have extra oversight or disciplinary action. And this is true, I know you're looking across professions, this is true in our previous studies conducted by our research team. And, um, and I believe this is one of the slides that David Studdard shared with you. But just the, the um, I have a pointer here. Um, but, you know, just the, the um, actual complaints really di drill down to just 3% uh, of physicians, 
and um, same for actual med mal claims. And then in our study at the bottom there, that was the very first thing we did once we were able to link our lawyer registry with our complaint data. That was, <laughs> that was absolutely, we were hoping to find this and we did, that um, there was a very, a very small pool that um, actually reflected all the complaints. So to think about this, we looked at about 20,000 lawyers, only 4,000 had one or more complaint. And it just was a, just from right from the get-go, it was a way to think about our resources differently. Uh, so with a risk-based risk approach, which is going to be the terminology I'll use going forward, I really liked how um, Dag had framed it as helping the legal profession regulation become more future-oriented and outward-facing. And this was exactly the goal that the, um, the Victoria State Bar had, had when we began our partnership with them. And they listed a number of areas in, in which to achieve that. So they wanted to identify lawyers' need of support. This included mental health, substance abuse, things that you probably have with your lawyer assistance program, um, as well as financial distress. And, and also aging lawyers was something they were looking at. And uh, they also really wanted to get a better handle on these, what they would call bad apples, who are these individuals that have 20 or more complaints and have had some disciplinary action. Why is that happening? They they are looking they admod <laughs> they are consistently modifying their intake process to focus more on the complaining witnesses and what that population looks like and uh, and they also are hoping to actually measure with their interventions how effective they are at reducing uh, future risks of complaints or misconduct. In addition to that. Uh, they don't have nearly the volume of complaints that you have coming through here, just given the scale of your, your the lawyers in California. Um, they received, so far, the entire study was about 16,000 complaints over a 10-year period, which I believe you have in one year. But that was still, they thought, too much. And so their goals were to actually reduce complaints through some of these actions. They had very uh, measurable metrics to keep in mind. Um, and, the, uh, and the other thing that they didn't do, but... Um, Dag alerted me to this, and I think it's something to think about, is um, how people, how the complaining witnesses or other stakeholders think about your overall process with the complaint-based system. Do they find it transparent and fair and clear, um, and, and ways to help address that, which could be very, which is great, because then you have metrics, baseline, before and, uh, and then after, uh, to see if you're improving upon. And may I interrupt just yeah. with a uh, clarifying question? Yeah. You I was taking notes. You said that the, there's value in having both the respondents and the complaining witnesses have greater clarity about the operation of the system? I think there would be all the stakeholders, sure. Yeah, yeah I, I would think so. I have a whole slide on engaging stakeholders, which includes the lawyers, the complaining witnesses, and board members, and general public. Terrific. Right. Uh, and then the ultimate goal, which is important to keep in mind, what exactly you want to accomplish with this large endeavor that you're exploring right now. And, uh, and for the Victoria State Bars, they wanted more effective regulation, ultimately protect the public from harm, poor legal, poor le legal representation, and improve the image of public trust for lawyers in that state. Can I yeah. just make a comment on the goal of reducing overall complaints? Right. Um, I wonder whether we should discuss making a sort of broader goal because reducing overall complaints sort of assumes that all misconduct results in complaints, whereas it seems like there's various types of violations of, you know, the code of professional responsibility that don't arise that don't ever get turn into complaints to the state bar, and so I wonder if there's sort of a broader goal of sort of <coughs> reducing misconduct in general or something like that. That's, that's a great question, and actually this compares very well with our experience in Australia. Only 7% only of the complaints resulted in a misconduct finding, mm -hmm. and you might have something similar with yours here. And uh, so part of that was around um, what the complaint process is for, uh, you know, certain things. They were, the, they were trying to get a better handle. A lot, many of the complaints in, in, in Victoria, Australia were just about cost. And uh, and so there, so one they actually passed legislation that required um, Australian lawyers to disclose their billing practices and then written and in, in informed consent from the client um, as part of as part of the legislation, and that dr had a dramatic effect on reducing their overall complaints um, once that was communicated um, in the mass media. So that's, so it is a good point. So it's a metric to think about how you'd really 
get use out of that. Um, but similar findings that very few actually resulted in a misconduct um, result. I think it, it seems yeah. to me there are two axes here. One is that there are complaints that come in that don't result in a um, uh, actionable um, violation by the attorney. And we talked a little bit about uh, that when Professor Stutter presented to the group. We talked a little bit about like, are there other avenues for um, making the client whole, for, make, for, for e evaluating what the problem is. If it's not a, an actual violation of the rules of misconduct that allow for discipline to be imposed, then what other avenues might be available to, um, to help the client? Um, the other issue, though, and I think that this was a little bit what you were getting at, is that all of the undetected uh, misconduct right. or misconduct that never rose to the level of a complaint or maybe the, the, the client didn't even know that there was misconduct or – um, and I think that, that – I, I think my question with regard to that might be um, if the distribution of undetected misconduct is similar to the distribution of that that is um, detected and complained about, then maybe what you're doing on the complaint side will still have effects that reverberate throughout those areas where you haven't detected it. But that's something that I would I, – I don't know if I explained myself well there. Right. Well, that is certainly a concern, undetected data. And, and when we looked, and I'll show you what our data, our, the results of our study look like, and you'll, you'll kind of probably like turn your head a bit and be like, hmm, <laughs> because you'll notice that larger law firms tend to have <laughs> less complaints against them because they settle and have. Yeah, sure. Right, right. Which is just so, what I was going to bring up. Is right. that people that are with a, a large firm or they're with the DA's office or right. the public defender's office, you know, there's an internal process that they may get disciplined within that. Right. But the bar never hears about that. And, you know, right. from, from what, I've, my, what I've seen is that, but there's still this misconduct going on with people that if they were a solo practice or someplace, they might have ended up being disbarred. But because they're protected yeah. by who they work for, they get to sort of hang on. So um, I don't even know how you detect that. But there, but, yeah. but, but it is a concern of mine. I don't yeah. know how you, I don't know how to measure no. it, right? I it's just either. unmeasurable, yeah. I think, but what, but there's, I mean, so the two ways of measuring it, I think you touched on this earlier, is, you know, complaints to the state bar, mm -hmm. to the regulatory body, and then there's malpractice lawsuits. Right. Right, and I think that those two universes ra often raise different types of claims, right? Like, there's usually, like, Certainly. you know, client funds issues that are raised to the state bar that don't get filed as a malpractice lawsuit, and then malpractice lawsuits will go to, like, you didn't leave this key. You didn't put this key provision into the contract you drafted for me, or you, you know, didn't get the right outcome. Right. right. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, you might. So there are different ways to handle this. Um, this is just the n kind of the nature of our system. That the, the biggest step is to identify that there that um, this could be biasing your data, and uh, and you could ask for a self-reported survey. I don't know how. Forth, how forthcoming um, people would be with that. Um, but I do think it's a really important, because when I do show you the data, you are going to see it slanted towards sole practitioners looking like they are not, that they are more prone to misconduct, which may or not have really been the case. That they just had different policies and practices in place at these larger firms that you just didn't hear about the, the issues of misconduct. Um, no, we didn't – okay, so some things we didn't figure out <laughs> in Australia. That's one of them. But um, but I think what's maybe reassuring about it is just across jurisdictions, it's a larger problem. And um, and so some of the things that they do, like if it's possible with, you know, to help smaller sole providers um, institute some of these practices that do reach a, a happy settlement or alternative pathway. Maybe there's resources that the bar could provide that would support them, that larger firms have resources for. Um, One of the things that Professor Studdard pointed out um, when he gave his presentation was also that there's a risk in um, those practitioners who are problems within an institution and leave the institution right. and then become solo practitioners. And it was the yeah. transition into solo practice from having been in a firm that sometimes was uh, looked like it could be an indicator of p future problems. Yeah, I think that's a good one. I think that would also apply to medicine. <laughs> I think that yeah, the example actually you. came from that. Medicine. So oh, yeah. yeah, sure. yeah no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Instincts are exactly right. <laughs> uh, is there any other thoughts before I, m I move on? These are great points. <coughs> yeah, I, I, I think one perhaps unintended, well, perhaps an unintended consequence of the conversation we just had might lead someone who's listening to think, well, 
bigger uh, legal organizations, be they DA's offices or, or public defender's offices or large law firms, uh, kind of cover up their, their problems. And that may be true in some instances, but more likely, I think, and more common in those big organizations is there is a uh, multiple layers of review and, and smaller problems are caught earlier and people who tend to make problems are either counseled or, I mean, there's, there's an internal discipline, you know, system, if you will. Okay. Um, so it's not necessarily a cover-up, it's just there's more institutional safeguards. I think that's I think that's true. And I, just to piggyback on that, absolutely. I mean, it, and not just a discipline system, but an audit system, mm -hmm. right? And so, for example, at our law firm, you know, we're a member of Alas, um, which is a lawyers ass assurance society. Like two hundred law firms are members of it. We provide the organization provides insurance, basically malpractice coverage, mm -hmm. um, for the member law firms. And there's a hugely robust set of auditing mm -hmm. reviews. There's, you know, we have two massive binders of best practices mm -hmm. in all various topics, um, checklists that you go through, and they'll come every year and do a full audit of how are you doing, identifying areas of risk and things that you can improve. They have sort of studies on, you know, what are the areas that give rise to the most types of claims, and so they'll identify, like, hey, these are sort of riskier practices, like when you have a lone wolf partner or when you have a bad client or when you have you know, when you're dabbling in an area that's not really your specialty. And so they have a sort of robust system of making sure you don't engage in misconduct, so no. it's, you know, preventing it from happening. Yeah, my, my hunch is that uh, some of our best um, practices for establishing really vibrant um, conflict uh, screening systems mm -hmm. came from uh, malpractice insurers, for, as an example. And those are, those are, those are great points, and I think highlight should you explore what an intervention could potentially look like? Th that could be one model to look at. And uh, I think I have that maybe in my 45th slide. <laughs> Should we just go to the end? <laughs> uh, oh, great. So wh uh, what we did in with, so the State Bar of Victoria is actually called LSBC. It stands for Legal Services Board and Commission. And, uh, and what happened, well, I'll get into all the, all the, what culminated at the very end of this experience with them, it was really two studies. And one was a quantitative study and one was a qualitative study. And we began with the quantitative. So this, this paper is certainly available for you to read. I'm happy to have it circulated if it hasn't yet been already. And, uh, and that was the quantitative side where we just really wanted to get a handle on who the lawyers were in the state and how that linked up with complaints and misconduct against them. Um, were, there, were there any areas of high risk? And then the second part was more of the, the qualitative. And that's where, and after, this is a phrase that one of my <laughs> colleagues loves to say, the quantitative uh, provides the skeleton. Uh, it gives you a general idea of like the contours of the map. Um, and then the qualitative actually puts it in color. Or um, it, how exactly did this 40-year career of misconduct happen? And like these deeper dives into whatever particular issue you'd like to focus on. Uh, and so that second study will be published shortly in the International Journal of the Legal Profession, um, which, I'm, which I'm also be happy to circulate. We're nearly there. <laughs> you can see the delay uh, with publication dates and, and work being done, about a, about a two-year delay from after the work's finished to it comes out in writing. So something else to keep in mind if <laughs> publishing studies is part of your goal. <laughs> So in the very beginning, uh, you know, we were starting from ground zero with the, with the Victoria Bar. It was um, uh, how do we look at your data? <laughs> what data do you have? And are there, and uh, basically are we looking for patterns? Like are there uh, some characteristics among your data that's in this smaller cluster? Um, and then important to the point that Zag raised earlier, Zag raised earlier on, um, are these significant? And, the way, and one way you measure something significant is you run a regression and you control for everything else, whether it's um, location, education, uh, gender, and like is it still significant when you look at this other factor? So, so those are the two things we tried to do. It took about a year um, to get all the data together and then analyze it. But we, had a, but we did have a smaller team than what I, th what I think you're working with. Uh, so in the very beginning, we, we looked at um, 
these lower level, lower level observations, sort of the um, demographics, the, the age, uh, gender, location, and, and then um, we got that from just the, they call them practicing certificates, which I guess you would just have your annual registration and renewals for lawyers in your state. And we compared that with all the complaint data. Um, the Victoria Bar did a lot of audits on their own as well, which we added to it, and then um, any types of uh, disciplinary findings or misconduct with our, with our tribunal court. And then uh, the actual inclusion criteria ended, there's 20,090 over that time period, that 10-year time period of lawyers in the state of Victoria, and um, about 4,180 of those lawyers had at least one complaint. And then within a complaint, sometimes there would be multiple issues. So there were actual 15,887 complaints, but then um, within that there could be cost, communication, um, conflict of interest. As you can see how these things would um, add up together. Uh, we excluded lawyers younger than 26 and older than 66, and, and part of that just because the, the data just got so low, it wouldn't have produced robust results. Um, but it's certainly an area that, especially the older side of it, as people continue to work later in life, every, everyone's focusing on more. These are our variables. Uh, and part of this came about from the data that was already collected. They actually have data going back to 1900, but <laughs> getting a handle on their, the more um, a, a study, you, you want it to be at least more than five years, um, you know, potentially 30, a century of data that's not really consistently collected wasn't really going to help you. So we went with a 10-year study and these very kind of basic variables in terms of, you know, the, um, the gender, age, looking at it in 10-year bands, we looked at uh, rural versus urban areas. In Australia, that was a little more, sim a little more uh, straightforward because it just tends to be urban or rural. So you either have a population over 100,000, which is the majority in Melbourne, or just rural for the rest of the state. Uh, you would have many more groupings in California. Uh, the type of legal practice gets in some of these issues, whether it's a law firm and house counsel, these are four types, and then, and, then we, and then we also distinguish by size, which we kept pretty straightforward for this purpose. Um, these were the areas of law we identified based off the complaints that we received and also what um, the lawyers uh, included in their, their annual uh, registrations and renewals. Uh, and then this is the part that took a long time. <laughs> this is complaints and how to code complaints. So this is uh, essentially there were there were eight in total uh, complaint types. The, I, the six I included here are really the major ones. The other two were kind of like an, an, an other miscellaneous category and then something specific to the bar. So it's not qu relevant for this purpose. Uh, and then in general. Um, the cost was by far, and I'll show you this in the data results, the one that was you know, most reported, um, along with competence and diligence and ethical issues. But what's interesting with the coding and thinking about complaint data is we also worked hand in hand with the University of New South Wales. And so when the New South Wales bar wanted to do a similar study, um, they adopted a, a similar structure for their complaint data, and that way we could really compare apples to apples with the two major states in the country of Australia. and. Uh, so as you work with other jurisdictions, maybe New York, whoever, um, uh, whatever would make sense for you, it's so nice to be able to benchmark your data, see if you can replicate studies. Just a lesson learned looking ahead is as much as you can get your data to align with other jurisdictions might be really nice to make more robust comparisons and see if what you're seeing is a real effect or if it's something that's just happening because it's a solar practitioner or you know, some of the other issues we were discussing earlier. The, uh, so essentially what we did is we collected all the demographic data on the lawyers and also their practice, uh, facts about their practices. And then we looked at that against the complaints and then we con conducted a regression to see if any of these characteristics really were significant um, and, and when we held all other var variables constant. So our results. Have any, has anyone familiar with any of this work or is it good to kind of go by it, go through it slowly? I'll go through it anyway. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> so essentially, and this might be interesting to see how this makeup compares with California, but the workforce tends to be comprised of 50-50 male-female. Um, but when it came to, oh, what, do you, what is it? <laughs> no, much higher. <laughs> right. Well, in law school, it's slightly higher female uh, to male. 
Oke. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, there tends to be sort of a ticking up trend. Yeah. Uh, so, and then lawyers with, um, but when it came to the actual complaints, um, women tend to have less complaints against them compared to men by comparison. This is how the, the flow works. And then similar, <laughs> it happens in medicine as well. There's a, actually medicine's a lar even larger. <laughs> Everyone's nodding. Great. I love it when <laughs> the results are confirmed. Uh, and then for, for older practitioners, older lawyers, um, they would make up a smaller percentage of the overall workforce, but we were seeing a lot more complaints for them. And so I'll get into this with some of our data limitations, but something to think about that was hard for us to collect and, and try to figure out, which is hours worked per week. And we did have a theory that female lawyers tend to come in and out of the workforce perhaps more than men do. Maybe they work part-time, work in different fields, so that could lend them to have <coughs> lower complaints perhaps than other uh, the comparative male lawyers. However, with older lawyers, um, they would arguably work less as they approach retirement, yet um, have more complaints. So, so that was a bigger flag to consider. But there could also be other reasons for that as well. Seniority and other issues that may have older, older lawyers more of a target. Do you have a comment? Risk-taking. As my yeah. sort of the anecdotal view right. is, that, is that it's because men are more willing to take riskier positions or dabble in things that they might not have expertise in. Um, so. <laughs> so interesting. I recently posted a, a, a position at my, at my employer, and a male colleague of mine specifically said, well, you should really make, because men are known to apply for a job where they may not meet all the qualifications, but a woman wouldn't apply for it. And I had to keep that in mind. I'm, like, I'm very aware <laughs> of that. Uh, and actually, in medicine, there's an interesting um, overlap there, the two that, that um, you know, particularly uh, surgeons or other practices take on the riskier cases. They, that's what they always argue with MedMal, where I take on the, the, you know, more difficult cases, and that's why I have more complaints or more deaths or more adverse outcomes. Um, so the, um, in terms of the actual um, types of practices, um, just the majority of the sample was from law firms, as you might expect, 56%, and they, and they, but they still had a higher proportion of the complaints. So if you compare it just to a, its counterpart below in-house counsel, 22% um, of the overall workforce would say they're in-house counsel, corporate counsel, but they only had 3% of the complaints. Which Would you count as small size practice solo practitioners who have their own right. firm and they're just operating solo? Right, exactly. It was a little more complicated in Australia for some reason. They didn't classify things the way we do here, where they might have three employ employees, um, and that would still be considered sole, but there'd be a principal, um, but very small. Uh, and, and so a similar effect where the 72% of the complaints were against the smaller size uh, practices. Again, that's 10 lawyers or under was how, was how it was finally defined, um, including Seoul. And then, and then, of course, larger, for the reasons we've discussed, um, had a, a much lower share of the actual complaints. So this might be interesting to think about is where, who are the sources of complaining witnesses or complaints? And by far, it was the actual client. Um, every now and then, it was a peer, and, and then very rarely, the regulator. We also looked at the area of law where they were coming, what was the primary area of practice for the lawyer, and family law um, had the, the most in terms of the complaints, which may or may not be surprising to you. I kind of thought wills and estates might be a little higher, but anyway, we all had our own theories about <laughs> where things would go. Is, is there any um, form of automated reporting by something like, say, a client trust account? Uh, we have an issue here where we see um, overdrafts of client trust accounts get automatically reported by the banks. Oh, okay. Oh, that's new. I didn't. I didn't. Um, hmm. No, we had no nothing automated like that. Yeah, they do focus a lot on trust issues. I um, it tended to be its own separate form of investigation at the bar, so I didn't include it in this presentation. But it's very uh, high on their priority list to get a handle on. Yeah, automated though is interesting. Yeah. Uh, and as I mentioned, the the vast majority was cost, but it wouldn't be unusual for a complaint to include these other issues as well um, uh, related to that. 
So this is how we ran our regressions. And what this means is that if you're a male compared to a female, all things staying um, neutral, you'd be 1.5 times more likely to have a complaint compared to a female. Oops, I thought a little thing. The biggest factor was small size practice. That was 3.4 times more likely if you were in a practice of 10 or fewer lawyers. Where it really saw a big effect was um, when there's a um, the odds of having a misconduct outcome, which we've already said is very low to even get there in the first place, and it seemed to really have an effect on smaller size practices. And I think this gets to another issue where representation of a lawyer in the adversarial pro pra process <laughs> might be an issue for smaller um, for lawyers who work in smaller size practices, uh, whether it's because of a financial means um, limitations or maybe a mental state, but. Um, this this uh, 13 times more likely to have a misconduct outcome among smaller lawyers and smaller practices was a most notable outcome of the study. Uh, just to summarize uh, what happened, uh, they confirmed both um, what's in the literature uh, about lawyers um, who who are who have complaints and have been found uh, to commit misconduct acts. Um, as well as other research about doctors and other professions. Um, it tends to be more male, older, rural. And, um, and then what I think our study added particularly was the complaint characteristics. It, it was uh, quite time consuming to code the data and drill down to those particular characteristics. And, and that's what you want. You want, to make, you want to make a real contribution to what's in the literature. But hopefully it still aligns with the body of work that's out there. Um, this is something th that came up earlier. 7% of the actual complaints do result in a misconduct finding. The, uh, but however, if it's a peer, it has a higher likelihood of resulting in misconduct. And if it's from the regulatory agency, it was nearly half that had a misconduct finding, which may not be surprising, but it's just something to think about if you would like to encourage more peer oversight or um, less stigma there. Uh, it was, it's a barrier in Australia as well. It was very rare that a peer would report another peer. Uh, we've already, I already mentioned that there was some study limitations and that we don't have hours worked um, and by area of law, which you know, could have an effect on the male-female um, complaints that we saw. And the other thing is complaint data isn't really the best data. Um, a certain kind of, you don't really, it might Individuals at larger practices may not, you may not ever see that data, may be undetected. So I think it would have made it um, going forward to think about other forms of data, um, maybe credit scores or um, DUIs or things that could like add to the character of a lawyer that might be interesting to dovetail with complaint data. Because it does tend to be retrospective and limited on who's actually filing a complaint. I think this is enti would be entirely proprietary information, but the thing that comes to mind is this large insurers, right. you know, claims data. If something is a potential, gets reported to the insurer as a potential claim, I mean, perhaps it could be reported in a sort of anonymized, aggregated fashion, mm -hmm. but that is yeah. at least a signal that there's potential misconduct. Right, and it may not even get filed as a lawsuit, but it's, right. you know, if it gets reported, if the law firm reports it to the insurer as, hey, we think there's a potential for a claim here. Right, and maybe they could de-identify de in such a way where you just have a sense of the general zip codes, um, area of law, just to give you, because I think the bottom line for what you'd like to achieve is just more tailored, effective interventions, and you need data to do that. That's a great idea. They might, yeah. Um, So I'll move on to our qualitative study, which I actually found. I mean, <laughs> I'm a statistician, and um, and I, I hadn't. This is actually the first qualitative study I did. I really enjoyed it, um, and that gets into you, we picked an area, and um, and that got into well, why? How are we having some lawyers that are, are still in practice for 40 years <laughs> with 95 complaints? He was <laughs> and very egregious, horrible, um, sad tragedies they really were so how did this happen and 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 the and, and these are things that gets a that gets a bar in trouble it's just the stuff that makes the news they wanted to get a better handle on it and we were fascinated as well at the university level so uh we took that uh pool of four thousand lawyers that you saw well I'll, I'll, i'm getting a little ahead of myself okay i'll get to i'll get to my data in a second so um so the major question they had is how did this happen <laughs> 
and how do we get on top of it? And I think we did, we were able to address that in the study. We were hoping to um, also answer other questions we weren't quite as successful at, but hindsight's twenty twenty, so I thought I'd share them with you. Um, what do we know about the complaining witnesses that are filing these complaints? We just, it just wasn't part of their intake process to get that information, and we couldn't glean it from the tribunal orders, and that would have been very helpful to know. And uh, also, um, the, the overall disciplinary process and sanctions, like the, what was happening to these lawyers? They were continuing to practice. Were any of our interventions not working? Why were they not disbarred earlier? Those types of questions. So we, the ones in black, <laughs> we didn't, unfortunately, um, the data didn't yield itself for that, but, um, but that, that would be a future study. That's what we say often, for future research. <laughs> So here's how we got there in terms of those 32 lawyers that we really drilled down um, to look to see how, how did this career of misconduct occur. We started off with our overall pool of 20,000, and then to the right, oh, to the, the high, the font, the, I don't know, the lighter blue coloring, um, with one complaint is that 4,000 uh, 4, uh, 4, lawyers with at least one complaint. And then basically, this is how the clustering works, right? Where um, as, you look, as you get down to the far right, you'll see that lawyers with 20 or more complaints, that's a nice tidy number of 102 lawyers. And then of that, as I said earlier, very few actually have any kind of, it still doesn't escalate after that. They might have 20 or more complaints, but maybe the complaints just don't really add up to behavior that lends itself to further investigation. So in order to actually conduct a qualitative analysis, you need some type of um, order uh, from a court or something, a report or about these lawyers. So that's what got us down to 32 lawyers that actually had some finding against them. So I just wanted to make sure that when you say complaint, it means the same thing that we mean when we oh. say complaint. Right. Um, and yes. so that is just um, a, a client or somebody else who is raising an issue that we have not yet determined whether or not there is potentially merit there that would right. that would uh, merit an investigation or a filing with with your tribunal or some uh, other official order. So, so right, because somebody could get a complaint that uh, we get twenty thousand complaints in a year, right? Um, and um, the majority, the vast majority of them, are things that. Are not actionable misconduct, right. and so they get they get closed right away. Right. Other things we we investigate um, because um, because we don't have enough information. They may be if everything that's alleged in the complaint is true, then this may be something that that um, rises to the level of actionable misconduct. So we do the investigation to get the facts to whether or not to support it. But the vast majority are ones where even if everything that was alleged in the complaint were true, it does not rise to the level of actionable misconduct. And so, so I just want to make sure that yeah. that's what you're talking about when you use right. the word complaint. Yeah, luckily <laughs> that, thank you for that clarification. Yeah, luckily that, that aligns very closely. The, that's the, the vast majority don't rise to actionable misconduct. They're not investigated. They're simply dismissed. I think 76 are just sort of dismissed right off the, go right off the board. So that's why to get to, yeah, we weren't just, targeting lawyers that got a lot of complaints or targeting lawyers that got a lot of complaints and they had disciplinary action. We wanted to get to the egregious acts and um, we, the, the real, the, the real um, bad apples. So, and then it was, was semi-manageable um, with even our small team to do this in about a year where we um, conducted, a, it's called thematic analysis, where we used a qualitative software called Navivo where we conducted case reviews, and we basically did that for those 32 lawyers, um, and that resulted in, and, they, and all together they had about 91 orders. And what we actually used the software against were the orders. And um, we had a coding process, where, which I'm happy to share the framework with um, you and your team, uh, where we went back and forth, where a small sample of like two or three of the investigators reviewed five of the files, did our own coding about different buzzwords or phrases that popped out based off the goals of the project. Um, and then basically, that's what formed the sort of hot spots and illustrative quotes for the project. Chang? No, no, I'm just, I'm excited about the coding issues because we're exploring this within our uh, Office of Court, uh, Office of Research. Oh. And um, we've also had been in conversations with the Office of Chief Trial Counsel regarding the allegations codes, which are problematic. There are, 
I want to say almost maybe as many as a thousand different um, <laughs> sections of the business and professions code. We used to have a problem with our old case management system where they were all grouped into maybe 13 allegations code over codes, overarching allegations codes, but the groupings themselves were not necessarily very logical. And so using right. those overarching allegations codes were not really getting you the granularity you needed. Now we have the opposite problem with the transition to a new case management system where we have the maybe almost a thousand different uh, potential allegations, but no logical groupings in terms of like, in the same way that you would see with like say criminal cases where you say, look, uh, there are property crimes, there are crimes of violence, there are drug crimes. I mean, there, and there's also a hierarchy of things that are more severe and things that are less severe, which we're really lacking within our uh, attorney discipline system. I mean, it, it certainly is a process, and I, um, I, I think that the at the end of the day, what we gave to the Victoria Bar was we could produce some studies. They have a much better handle on their data, but they they actually got a, a stronger sense of more logical groupings, how to conduct their operations and affairs going forward. I mean, it's just a helpful internal review for them. So, I mean, something to explore with this process. Um, and then they also were interested in, you know, how, how are they currently doing, with the status quo of doing business, is it even, are sanctions having any kind of effect that they would hope it would, is something else that they were trying to look at with these reoccurring offenders. So you'll see how a qualitative study builds upon a quantitative study. Uh, we know the kind of data that we have now, you know, we know their, the general demographics of these lawyers, um, and also types of practices that they, the size and where they work at. What we added um, in our theory was that maybe there's just some major life, stressful life events that could be happening. So we used the social readjustment rating scale. You can use, there are many things out there. <laughs> this, was just, this was the one that seemed the most um, relevant to our study, where they had about 16 different types of life events. Things that you would imagine, any kind of financial distress, bankruptcy, divorce, a, a bereavement, um, adding to um, um, other issues that someone could be having with mental health or age-related decline or substance abuse. Uh, and so we were just we just wanted to get a handle on that, how often that may have showed up in the court order, and um, and also the sanctions. We were hoping to get, and we didn't get from the data that was available, um, whether or not the the reoccurring offender had representation that just wasn't consistently known. That would have been great to have known um, and how that would have impacted um, just, uh, just having that information. Um, and then also anything about the complaining witness, unfortunately, was just not consistently reported. And we had theories that kept like surfacing within the coding framework where they tended to be female, um, older, uh, limited education. We had many situations of uh, refugee or immigration coming um, coming forward when we did the coding framework. English was not the primary language. Um, there could be some impairment or disability that showed up as well, but it wasn't consistent enough where I can't really present you anything more than anecdotal information, but that would have been really valuable within the broader picture of looking at these reoccurring offenders and whether or not they're preying upon or exploiting certain kinds of complaining witnesses. Or maybe their practice is in a, such that's an area true. where that's only people that come to them that's because true. they're in sort of that neighborhood where right. you're the only lawyer here, and so that their their clientele right. is like kind of limited, and so they end up with right. work a place because they're also trying to help people right. who have more issues. Right. No, that's, that's a very good point. I agree. Uh, we don't, but we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> and, and but I think that that's a, an important to think about that both ways. Right. Yeah. Uh, so basically, this, the results just became a little more um, narrow than what you saw with the qu quantitative study, where I think I said 70 percent-ish of them were of men were in that um, grouping compared to the when they had one or more complaint of these higher end offenders. 90 percent were male, um, compared to about 50 in the in the overall workforce, 50 percent, and then um, and a little more were over the age of 56 than the general workforce. Um, and also similar to what you found with practice, um, they were tended to be in sole, sole practitioners or from smaller size firms. This was, this was actually just sole practitioners. This was three or more to your question. Um, is it Heidi? Heidi? Hi Lynn. Hi Lynn. Hi Lynn. Hi Lynn. Hi Lynn. And 
and then urban. And I ha and then so what's neat about what this uh, actually Tara, looks like. Excuse oh. me, just a minute. Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, the previous slide. Yep. You said 20 percent were over age 65. Right. But there are only about five age bands, right? Yeah. Well. Uh, so. That's yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that I mean, was. So, I mean, if there were 20 percent in each of the five. I mean, so it's kind of a neutral. Isn't that a kind of a neutral finding? There were. Uh, well, or what am I missing? Well, I can go back to the quantitative slide if you'd like. Um, the there were about seven percent though they were working in that older age group. Oh, okay. um, it wasn't evenly distributed across the age bands. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. right. And in either way, you'd want to look at what's happening in California specifically in that area. But um, and and we couldn't go beyond 56 to 65 with our data set. But I think. It'd be interesting to see what it looks like over here, 65 to 76. Um, and how many hours a week they work. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so when you actually code the data, um, you these are some of the terms that will come up. So like blurred professional boundaries was something we put into the software. We wanted to know if that term came up. Professionally isolated. and. Um, so that, so, so those are some of the quotes, and then things that you can pull out to kind of paint a bigger picture. And this is exactly what the um, what the judge said as part of the disciplinary action that you know there was just a blurred relationship that was contributed to this misconduct occurring um, because of the rural location, um, and then and then just concerns and some professional isolation. And then as you read these, your mind might be thinking, well, what interventions could be particularly targeted and helpful for someone that's having these kinds of issues, where it wouldn't just be a, a, a warning letter or um, continuing legal education. It might be peer counseling or mentoring or supervision. You might pick a different intervention based off um, what you're seeing and as you drill down in the data. And this was really, this was sort of new to look in this area of health impairments and stressors. Um, and very interesting to think about alternative pathways going forward. Uh, so there about half of the um, orders, uh, well, uh, of the clients, so of 32 lawyers, about half of those, 17-ish, had some type of physical or health, mental health issue. And the, by far, depression was the most one that was commonly cited and that often included a psychiatric evaluation, which was rarely mentioned, <laughs> one out of 32 uh, mentioned, um, uh, alcohol, substance abuse as a as an issue. And I think that comes to some of the stigma against um, reporting substance abuse and, and things to think about where it could be an, a very real issue that's just not reported, undetected. Maybe maybe the, the lawyer um, didn't feel that it would mitigate the um, outcome at all in terms of the actual findings of misconduct. Um, so, and then stressors, uh, uh, financial distress was also heavily reported. Um, and then about a third had very um, personal stories regarding um, death of a child or loved one um, or even illness, actually. Caregiving was a prominent role. Anyway, it was helpful to get to understand more beyond just the demographics, the full story behind some of these reoccurring offenders. I believe uh, David Studdard shared the slide with you um, when he did his talk, but it wasn't just it was it wasn't usually one thing. It was usually multiple things. There was a, a divorce um, related to some kind of um, depression or anxiety. There, they, there could be age-related issues, and then you know just kind of kind of just life and things that happen in life and its ups and downs. But they were very interconnected. So a very common situation. Uh, you may. You may have thought this from seeing how the data is unfolding, that you'd have a sole practitioner. There could be some reported pressures, particularly financial or maybe depression, um, and that may have resulted in some of the poor legal performance and complaint. Uh, so the other thing I wanted to touch upon is the actual complaint process, which was not one of our theories that kept surfacing in the um, court orders, well, how that could be a contributing factor, because it was really unclear with some of the cases whether the person had depression before the complaint was filed or after the complaint was filed, and how that may have added to their anxiety and, and fear of, of their workload and, and, and just general distress. So this one, um, in one order, this is a particularly profound quote, I think, um, in 2013, and the, the um, 
the court says they must think about it, give their attention to it, and take steps to address the complaint, respond appropriately, seek help and advice at an early stage. It'd be wise to appoint someone to act on their behalf and have representation. And then I think this really gets to the heart of the matter is you want to deal with the poor legal performance, not the actual complaint. And that's where you can get to some of these <coughs> alternative pathways that maybe something to consider going forward is, well, what is the actual issue that's causing the misconduct or claims of misconduct to happen? Um, and it may not, you may not get at it from just somebody filing a, a, a complaint. Or the, or the way that, or after the complaint's filed, how to treat it, so that a lawyer would want to seek help earlier and and get more on top of their you know personal financial issues or um, other pressures. I think one challenge that stands out to me is you know all of those factors that you cited; those are things that like at the law firm we train people to recognize, right? Mm. You know, we tell people, like we tell secretaries, because often it's secretaries who are the first to see impairment or issues is if you see something, say something about it because those are all warning signs that there could be things, you know, not being done properly on your cases. Um, we never like to have what we call a lone wolf on a case. It always matters if there's multiple lawyers because they can detect if there's been an oversight or, some, you know, something's not going right. So we encourage reporting, but, like, what do you do with a solo practitioner? Like, who's going to keep an eye on them? So it just raises the question of what what sort of, prevention interventions can you take in those situations? Right. Do you want me to, I, I have a, I have oh, a, you're I have a, <laughs> <ahead>. <laughs> you're right. Well, that, okay. I mean, this, uh, the issue that you're raising was an issue that happened in, in Victoria, Australia as well. And, and that um, task force took it upon themselves and we're going to do more audits. So one of the things they did is they said, well, we know if you're older male and you live in these zip codes, because we can map them, um, we're going to conduct random audits and help you with your case files and kind of and they had a very proactive way that they were trying to address the issue so that was the way their intervention and we did not actually flag them to do that right away but they were so excited with the data they immediately started the process and um, but now it, and so I think one way to think about that though is you might want to have a random randomized control trial where you know you are doing that something like that where c certain zip codes you do target these sole providers that match this demographic profile um, and don't in others to see if it makes a difference to, to expend your resources that way. So what would happen? They would come in and they would go over the files with the lawyer. They would look at their record keeping, um, they look at their caseloads, the area of law that they're practicing in. They would speak to them about um, any type of um, issues perhaps going on and offer resources. Yeah. It, to me, like, so you asked me earlier if I was in public health. I do, <laughs> I do a lot of representation of health systems, so oh. I'm quite familiar with the accreditation and credentialing process. Right. And in for doctors, like, to and hospitals to maintain accreditation, like, they just have to, there's a focus not just on, like, are you practicing good medicine, but, like, are you running the business properly, and do you have sort of the right systems in place? And we don't do that, right? Like, what we do for continuing... A, a credit, you know, licensing, right, to get your, you have your MCLE right. requirement. And so that can be anything, right? Like people will take like a course on like, you know, the new <laughs> development in antitrust law or whatever, but right. nobody ever is looking at like, are you managing conflicts correctly? Right. Are you making sure that you have a good docketing system so you're not missing filing deadlines? You know, that sort of, are you running your practice in a way that minimizes the risk of misconduct? That's great. That's a great idea. So this accreditation process is with JCO and, thing, and it has real teeth. So if a hospital health system doesn't comply with it, they lose their Medicare or Medicaid reimbursement. And for some hospitals, that could be the, the, the vast majority of their income pool. Well, yeah. it's far be it for me to be an advocate for the uh, <laughs> insurance industry. <laughs> but uh, in, in fact, uh, when you do apply for a malpractice insurance, generally you have to go through a long checklist and there's often an audit of some kind, whether it's on-site or, or paperwork or whatever, since we don't uh, require legal malpractice insurance in the state, that may be missed by a number of people. Yeah, but the, 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 the great, those are great points. Um, and interesting where the similarity ends between healthcare and, and law profession too. Yeah. Oh, so then we looked at the sanctions. And um, this is what they typically do uh, in Victoria, uh, where it might just result in a warning letter that's 
by far the most um, dominant one, especially for a first time offender. And, it, and if it isn't, if it was a relatively minor issue, um, it might, it might d result in some kind of professional development or CLE that's more targeted based on what the complaint's about. Um, and certainly supervision was very commonly utilized in that jurisdiction. Um, and then, then it just got you know, more extreme depending on uh, what the issues might be, whether there should actually be some suspension, restriction, or disbarment. So they were looking at how to make their process more systematic, consistent, transparent. Um, so what we did with the coding for them is we tried to identify how they came to make these decisions regarding which sanction to, to, um, to recommend or, be, or, or whether or not it should even escalate the issues. So what came about was um, five broad factors and how it seemed that they were determining, how the court was determining which sanctions to, um, to implement against someone. So sometimes, because oftentimes it could, uh, it could nothing could happen, right? They could say, "Oh, well, you're, you know, this is you're still relatively new to the practice of law, and um, let's just wipe the slate clean." But they seemed to be, as we were doing the coding process, these ideas of blameworthiness, um, uh, questions of morality in terms of what the actual issues were, how egregious they were. Um, certainly, pr previous disciplinary action came up. Um, the number of compl the actual impact on legal profession. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you could have 20 or more complaints to fall into this basket of the sample, but it could all be from the same client that just hates you. <laughs> so the idea was how, how to get a better handle on the complainants across the board and to see if you were really, really causing a negative impact for you and your profession, harming the public. Um, vulnerability of clients came up too. If it was someone that's identified, for example, in the data, someone came twice there were Holocaust survivors that came up or individuals with severe trauma that the court took much stronger action upon than if it was someone of the same issues without that previous um, background. And, um, and then and just, and and all, and just the overall consequences of the profession. So we basically went through each of these and they seem to all have a bit of a factor in how, what type of sanction may be implemented and um, and the idea at the very end of this would be, well, could we create some kind of scoring matrix or some kind of um, framework in which it's not just a, a random situation where someone comes in that has 10 complaints and it affects these people. Like, what, what are some of, like, to help guide the process for both the lawyers and the com complaining witnesses, like, how does this work um, in terms of actually determining what sanctions should happen and then evaluating uh, whether or not it's been effective against a reoccurring offender, or did it reduce risk of future complaints? Let's so try to gain a handle on their current practices, basically. Um, it was messy. <laughs> that was the first. It was the first step is to identify it, and then and then to try to put it in some kind of framework. Uh, well, the next phrase of the presentation goes on to some of um, my potential recommendations for things to look at based off our experience in Victoria. And I will, I would first suggest that, um, you know, however, uh, the last, that, that time period of my life, 2016 to 2018 could be useful. When I worked with the, uh, the bar there, I'd be happy to share with you. I think one of the, I think one of the striking things to think about right from the start is, you know, what, what are, I know you're interested in going into risk-based regulation and being proactive with your efforts, but what's your overall major aims? Um, and what that could look like in terms of metrics to see if you're meeting certain milestones within a certain timeline. And, and that's really a question that I'm happy to help facilitate and give um, my experience in, but ultimately it will, it will be what are your goals, you know, and, and, and in short and long term as well. Uh, and then I suggest you take inventory, which I know you're working on, um, with your data analysis and coding, um, particularly with complaints, your inclusion criteria, um, potentially looking beyond complaint data, if you were successful with working with some of the insurance in, in this area, that, that would be fantastic to add to the complaint data. Um, I'll talk about hotspots in a second and stakeholder engagement. And then, and then I'll go into some suggested pilot interventions that might be fun to, not be fun, <laughs> you can tell that I have my little 
research data hat here on, but um, you know, to see if what you're doing is making an impact or um, all these alternative pathways. So I'll go through each one in turn, and we can and we can just discuss it. But um, it's very very helpful to have an inventory of how your data is lining up with the the lawyers in your state with the complaints disciplinary action against them, and as much as you can tell who the complaining witnesses are. And I'm not sure if you've done any, if you're still kind of approaching that area, or work has already been done in it. Work has been done in a different, <laughs> with a different yeah. focus, but oh. we're going to be repurposing that data for, for this focus. Okay. Uh, the, the two um, demographics highlighted in red are things that we didn't do as much as we could have in Australia, um, which was regarding older age and also looking at race. Uh, the first we just didn't have the data for, and the second we didn't have the um, political <laughs> ambition for. Uh, so that, that's what happened with that one. Um, the hotspot map, I can share these with you. They're pretty cool. They look kind of like Yellowstone or Iceland, <laughs> where you have like your state of California, and you'll really see how it goes from like green, yellow, red to help you drill down to certain pockets of the state and, and the profile of lawyers in that area to address. They may, to all the points that were raised earlier, it's still, data is still flawed, and things, uh, complaints aren't going to be detected at larger firms. You're going to end up with a smaller provide smaller practitioners overly represented but I think as long as you know that going in um, it will just help it help address the intervention that you ultimately want to achieve um, and then we've already talked about potentially additional data you know survey data can be quite helpful I don't know if you survey your constituents but um, it's hard to find out things like average hours per week or caseload or other things that could be adding stress that you may want to include as part of your intervention um, so this could be another, so in addition to like other studies on top of what you could be doing, one is, you know, how do we get more data? And then the beyond complaint data. Um, and the other one might be stakeholder engagement. So this is a very new cutting edge avenue that you're approaching. And it may not, it may be worthwhile to take a step back and think, is this aligned with what your, the population that you're serving wants to have happen? And um, so some of the things that we talked about in Victoria was, um, what are these advantages? What are the costs? Um, various implementation. Um, does this fit with us? You know, clearly it fits within the health profession to have this type of really strong oversight. They have a history of it. Um, it re directly ties to their reimbursement. Um, but this is new for law. And I think it's nice to allow individuals to give their input from across the stakeholders. And um, I think they all, and I think what also might come out of it is, you know, more targeted interventions that you might want to implement. It's just nice to have that conversation, and and it could be a, its own study in and of itself. Uh, so, so, I believe the process here is that you might have when someone has a complaint that comes in, um, a specialist attorney would review it. They probably would review the lawyer's file to see if there's been other complaints against that lawyer, you know, how recent, how, like, how, how similar, um, and then they might ask for a written response from the lawyer to explain their actions, is, is the process I gather. Um, and then they may or not um, issue a, res a resource or warning letter, or it may escalate to a formal investigation. Um, so one thing to consider with this process is how to kind of take it out of the black box, ways to have some kind of scoring matrix, make it more transparent. These were just the things that came up in Victoria, but um, by no means was this a clean process. But it might be helpful to think about that, and that could that could support your overall um, satisfaction levels. Trying to improve those with your complaining witnesses or other stakeholders, how they view this entire process to make it seem more transparent and fair. Um, one thing that can be very exciting with the interventions is um, when you think about that. Um, all these lawyer characteristics, so let's say someone who's older or in a solar practice, when you're trying to implement a, an intervention, whether it's a warning letter or required counseling, um, how could that um, vary across populations? And that's how you get, a, a, I think, an a evidence base of you know, what interventions are working and for what practitioners. Um, so you're not just like randomly assigning things, but there, there's um, real value in it. And, and then the way to do that is actually a randomized controlled trial where you have the, you know, you keep everything the same between two pockets of lawyers that are maybe, and then what you now have, which you have the data of, and then you, um, you do certain interventions with one 
group and not the other group. Uh, and that's what they did with the workplace review in Victoria, where they did the, the random audits among these older rural lawyers as they um, did it for some groups, not others, and then they can evaluate you know, within a year or two um, with that was the group that had the intervention less likely to ha have complaints or eventual misconduct. Yeah. Um, one thing that strikes me, and this goes, sort of goes back to the Joint Commission, Jayco yeah. example that we talked about. One current gap in how we do things is we're always focused on disciplining the individual. Mm. And so complaints come in the form of this individual did something wrong. And discipline is meted out individual by individual. And there's a focus on the individual. And there's not any sort of looking at or oversight of a firm, right? So a firm of three people or a firm of five people or a firm of 200 people. Right. There's not the same sort of accreditation yeah. that the medical profession has. I really like that. And so we, I keep calling them bad apples, these bad lawyers. But what's so the one phrase that came up, and we weren't able to address it uh, yet, is bad barrels. <laughs> and that was the way we were looking at the, the actual firm or culture a as a whole. That pro protects bad apples, right? If right. the bad apple is in an organization that protects that person or yeah. does not have a system in place to detect and prevent that person from yeah. engaging in misconduct, shouldn't that be something that we potentially look at? But it's just different from our, our traditional model has always been we look at the individual. Right. Well, when we looked at the um, – because when you have, so when in Australia, when they file their practicing certificate, they file both their primary residence as well as their um, practice residence. So there could be a way to think about how many lawyers from a certain firm or practice are having these complaints. And you could look at your data that way, and that would be a great initial first step to see, to identify the bad systems. I think that's great. That's a great idea. And I think that, I think you'll find that you'll see uh, some overlap there. Yeah, and I, I think um, I think in a very limited way, <coughs> um, in a very limited way, th this is sometimes done in the Office of Chief Trial Counsel, okay. where they see a number of complaints coming in that. <coughs> it, it, I think in part it's if they coincidentally all come to you know a, a number of them come to the same person, they realize like, that oh, it's the that same, it's the yeah. same firm, right. and so maybe there is um, so there is no complaint against. The, um, the person who runs the firm, but the state bar then creates a state bar initiated complaint for um, failure to supervise or oh, something like that against the, against the individual in the firm um, who is sort of allowing all of this behavior that's leading to multiple complaints. But it really isn't a, isn't concentrated, a concentrated effort um, um, because we, we're not sort of tracking the complaints mm -hmm. by firm name um, organization or, or organization whatever. and um, and we don't regulate the organization right we don't right. regulate law firms we only right. regulate individuals and so this would really have to be a change in the regulatory structure if it's not just saying identifying like this failure to supervise or something like that well, but identifying you know, uh, problems that are going on that we would be recommending to the entity mm -hmm. that they need to address or suffer some consequence. Well, currently the only, the there is a rule though, right? There is the rule that imposes on managing partners um, and heads of law firms the professional obligation to make sure that the members of the law firm are complying with their professional obligations. But again, that's like focusing on the individual. Like you as an individual have this obligation. Um, and there isn't, Again, this is sort of like a uh, sort of after the fact kind of discipline system as opposed mm -hmm. to a loss prevention or a sort of risk prevention or risk mitigation system that credentialing sets up, right? And as Alan said, that exists with the getting malpractice insurance process, but that's a sort of private process and it, there's not like a regulatory presence in that space. Some of the things that we've talked about in the the area of risk based uh, risk based regulation, can't say that. Um, is, R -R. <laughs> is is sort of not right. You're looking at not relying on individual complaints coming in, but identifying right. whether it's characteristics about right. about a particular lawyer, people who practice X type of law, who are in various zip codes, or sort of whatever the appropriate things are. Um, 
<coughs> you know, looking, you doing, figuring out a way to, to audit, if you will, um, audit, audit them um, to identify, identify problems before they happen. Right. Um, but it does sort of go to that same issue, it, is should you be doing that audit mm -hmm. of, of, the, of the entity um, and, and how would that get done? And, and what, would, what would our structure need to look like if that was something that the state bar would be, would be doing? And because even the sort of the risk-based regulation as we've envisioned it still looks at the individual mm -hmm. and not the entity of which they are part that has some, that could have some responsibility for um, uh, preventing and, re and resolving some of the issues that lead to the complaints. Mm -hmm. You could almost, maybe one way to approach it, because it's such new territory, is have a sort of softer launch, um, uh, a, 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 a voluntary, where like you could, now that you'll know, like wow, a lot of uh, lawyers in this particular practice are having quite a few complaints against them. We'd like to offer this, these resources and um, CLEs that may be an issue, we'll come out and visit. I mean, it could be a softer approach, um, a carrot instead of a stick, and see how what the reaction is. Um, I don't. I don't know what. I don't know what it might be. But it it, it would be it'd be a one way to sort of approach it um, and kind of get that stakeholder engagement that you're also looking at. I would think where you want people to be on board with this new risk based regulation, or even putting out like best practices and having people yeah, sort of like right. self check against those right. best practices, so it doesn't feel so like stick yeah. right. right away. Right. I, like yeah. it's just sort well, of like a here's. Here's kind of some checklists to go through. I, especially, I think maybe for the solo practitioners um, that are ones that are as they're starting out. I think we even talked about this last time about maybe the ones that leave a firm and then now they're mm -hmm. solo. That you give them a notification. These are some of the things you might want to look out for now. Now that you're uh, in a solo practice, right. and you're not, you don't have the, mm -hmm. you don't have your firm doing all the some a lot of the administrative stuff for you. Mm -hmm. So these are things that you need to look for now as a solo practitioner, and maybe. Um, yeah, that's definitely the plan, and that's why we were collecting firm size information. We're going to start collecting firm size information mm -hmm. for that very reason, so we could identify that somebody is switching, um, and that's the best example, switching from uh, a, a, an entity other than a solo practice to a solo practice where suddenly mm -hmm. they yeah. have um, responsibilities related to a client mm -hmm. trust account. They, have, they don't have sort of the insulation of other folks giving them guidance and helping them um, do things. They've got more direct client communication for a variety of things, Th and they just, it, it is not malfeasance, it is simply n n not knowing what right. their responsibilities are. The other thing that we're looking at, and an item will be brought to the board in May, um, is a self-assessment, um, an online oh, self-assessment yeah. similar to what Colorado has, Illinois, some other states. Um, we are talking about starting with rolling out um, uh, based on the direction that we get from the board, but the recommendation will likely be starting with a module on client trust accounting. Um, and it could be that if you score, <laughs> um, you know, below a certain thing on the, on the self-assessment, then maybe you are required to take an MCLE course in client trust accounting. Um, something like that. And we can, one of the things we want to brainstorm with the board is sort of sequencing what are the most important things to roll out first. Right. So we can't develop it all at once. Um, but if we start the self-assessment model um, with with the biggest areas uh, where we, you know, either the, the largest number of complaints or the complaints with the most impact, mm -hmm. um, then we can do that. But it's also uh, self-assessments are, are um, tend to be, you know, voluntary. We're right. not tracking you. We're not, right, because we want you to do it. And we want you to understand, hey, here are all these things. And, oh, I didn't know any of this, right? We want you to learn that and not fear that we will be tracking it and right. will discipline you for that. Right. So, so we're going to have to figure out sort of how to, sort of, how to encourage everybody to do this self-assessment, um, and at the same time, provide some teeth. Could there just be like an MCLE certification that I have done this self-evaluation, yes. right? Yes. You don't have to provide the results to yep. the state bar, but just say, I've done it. Mm -hmm. Right, and there are some examples in Australia and some papers on um, online self-assessment that I can share um, with Dag to share with you. There's, I know there's a paper about, I'm not sure if it's Queensland or New South Wales, but they, it was voluntary, it was just the results that you completed it, um, and it was meant to, um, 
for that exact purpose, where it was with the, they call them the ILCs, the Incorporated Legal Corporations. And since it was a different setup than a law firm or solo, they, they were targeting to that area. But it's the same idea of where you might be lacking, what the best practices are. The survey might be interesting for you to look at. Um, I was just going to come back to this point of the carrot versus the stick with some of these things, because they also, with the, they threw this a little bit in Australia, and they really encouraged it in Arizona <laughs> when I recently did a talk there, where they liked the stick. I like this idea of public shaming, where they would put in the, I know, and they put in the, I have something to just put out there, both sides of the coin. Um, they would put in the annual report, you know, who some of these bad practitioner lawyers that were. That gets published in the Daily Journal. Yeah. Like yeah. The Daily Journal yeah, does, does, so it's a, like a daily legal publication. There uh. is like a section of, of who's been disciplined by the state bar, mm -hmm. and there's like a whole write-up of them. So there is a public shaming right. element already. Right, <laughs> for <laughs> better, oh right. Yeah. I bet you could add um, practices and firms to that too. No. Yeah. No. Exactly. Do you think it has an impact yeah. among yeah. among the profession in terms of reputation or um, changing behavior? <laughs> That's the bottom line. Does it change behavior? I don't have a set. I mean, mm -hmm. I look at that section because sometimes I'm like, oh, what are people going to school for? <laughs> um, but I, right. I don't know that there. I don't have a good sense of whether that's widespread. They put it in the annual report um, that the bar issues in Austria and Victoria. The, they'll list it in the back. Like who was good, who was bad. Yeah. Did you have you is there any part of this presentation where you may talk about the peer review system that or have you thought uh, about the peer review system that's in the that's in the US in the medical profession? Where there is a sort of like after action review together with your peers of right of a bad Right. So that there's a outcome. right, exactly. Um you may have seen this in TV shows or movies <laughs> where you have to go up before your peers to say, and it's a, and it's a learning t tool as well, like what you could have done differently, um, why you didn't think of X, like what was your decision-making process. Yeah, what can right. you do in the future to right. prevent that from happening? Right. I mean, that was one of the interventions proposed, and I think that's a great one. I guess, I guess part of it's just a resource issue and how it would be, um, how it would be actionable, like how it would be the trigger, like, for that to happen, I guess. I don't know if you've thought about that already. Yeah. I, I would just wonder whether that concept could be imported into yeah. this profession. I mean, it seems really urgent in the medical profession because right. a bad outcome means somebody's injured or they die or something like that, right? And, and they so, build it into and their... And they build it into the yeah. whole culture and right. ethos. And I know that, you know, in my, in our ALAS organization, there's been a big push to do after-action reviews. And so mm -hmm. we had someone from the military come and talk about how in the military that's part of the ethos is you do this after action review so after something happens everybody gets together and talks about okay why did this happen how what are all the steps where you know mistakes occurred or what do we need to do differently what processes do we put in place to make sure that doesn't happen um and i just wonder whether something like that would be useful in the i think it would be law profession context mm -hmm. oh go ahead I just want to say from um, from my background, too, because I did a lot of um, mm -hmm. threat assessment and a lot of emergency procedures and that kind of So we always did after actions. We always do after actions because that's how you learn, right. you know, what, what went right, what went wrong. If we did drills, what happened, you know. Oh, but all the radios went dead. Okay, well, that wasn't a good thing. But so we need to buy new ones. But I think that that after action, then you kind of see you can drill down as to where the problems are, and I think that that um, can inform what you do in the future, so yeah. And perhaps for recidivists, it yeah. could reduce yeah. recidivism if you actually start developing a culture of rather than saying like, oh, I'm not gonna look at that because it's too painful. Mm -hmm. Like, let's you know all come together and look at this with a spirit of how do we improve going forward. Because actually they may get disciplined and may not really truly understand what they did wrong mm -hmm. in right. terms of you know where their missteps may have been, because I don't know and that they'll those- they'll do it again. Right? Yeah, and then they'll just do it again because they never really understood what where, where their, their first misstep was and how they went down the wrong path, so. Or oh, that could be one of your alternative pathways is like a first step before some more severe action taken. They have to go to this class or this group that meets once a month and there's a facilitator. Uh, that could be one of your pilot interventions to explore. But yeah, but you have to somehow build it into the system, right, where they know that they have to go there before they do anything else. And yeah. I think there's also a prevention component in 
there it's mm-hmm. being like assertive right. rather than it oh, being post yeah. post discipline for the yeah. person who's in trouble like yeah. there's the benefit for the people who are participating there and is. listening to it learning about it right. so that it never happens to them um does mouth practice insurance do anything like that with the group that you described a- yeah there's yeah. a li- there's yeah. a bunch of that there's sort of they walk you through sort of real life scenarios like here's how yeah. it unfolded let's talk about where all the mistakes happened and how that could have been prevented mm-hmm. um and it's done in a sort of anonymized fashion. so there's like annual right. conferences and stuff like that right. and they'll have the sort of like case study right you know and everybody listens to it that way and then yeah. discusses it in a group and talks right. about sort of like what is what does your organization do in this yeah. regard and so maybe <coughs> maybe we need to think about things that today we would issue a resource letter or a warning letter or maybe even an agreement in lieu of discipline um, that um, well, I would say probably part it would be part of an agreement in lieu of discipline that that right instead of doing a warning letter especially if the statistics that we had that we saw from Ron V the other day were that you know the um, recidiv- recidivism rate is pretty high um, for people who have received a warning letter. They're still we're still getting complaints. We're still mm-hmm. getting things moved forward to the state bar court. Maybe instead of that, or in addition to that, um, you would have yeah. this kind of class. Yeah. And so it would be, it would be. I'm now in my head, sort of thinking about the 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 uh, the groups that the lawyer assistance program uses. Mm-hmm. N- not obviously using those groups, but that kind of model where you'd have sort of a a, 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 you know, a, a monthly or sort of however frequent is, is necessary, um, where you would have to come and do this. Okay, let's for those of you in the room, sort of what what are the issues that that you engaged in that brought you here, and then somebody would have to be be there to actually talk about because there will be the defensiveness and the they said I did this but I didn't do anything wrong. Right. Well, let's talk about that. Here's what the rules are. Nobody's rejudging anybody's individual behavior, but. You know, here's mm-hmm. what the, here's what the rules are. It's an, it's an interesting it's an interesting thought. Um, I feel like waive your privacy rights in order to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From the outside, I don't know that you know lawyers would want to put themselves out there yeah. like that in terms of saying that you know yeah I, I messed yeah, up. Yeah, me. I messed yeah, up. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That they that they would be um, comfortable necessarily doing that. Mm-hmm. I um I, I like the idea though, but I, it's but it's going to be. That's a whole culture change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, to me, that's a whole culture change in terms of lawyers and how they perceive themselves. And um, yeah, yeah. Be, in medicine, it's just part of the culture. Everyone yeah. knows that you have these peer reviews and that it's done to prevent mortality. And yeah, well, they start young too. They start in medical school. Right. Like it, yeah. So right. it's part of our. It's to interact with law schools more. Um, at the law school level. Mm-hmm. But I wonder whether the, the exa- I agree with you that lawyers are not going to want to like stand up there and be like, I did this wrong. <laughs> right. But um, maybe what Debbie proposed could be done in a sort of anonymized fashion. Like, I don't know who you would invite to it or require to attend it, but you could say, we're going to present you with some anonymized scenarios that actually happened and talk you through it. Right? You'd have to get the cooperation of the lawyer who's the subject of it, I guess, but um, that might in itself be a process that's really worthwhile to go through. I mean, you'll have the, you'll have the facts. You would need a right, facilitator to right. put it together as a case study. Mm-hmm. You can invite 10 people to the room or the webinar. I mean, it, could all, it doesn't have to be face-to-face. That would be better, but given your large state, <laughs> more realistically, you might need to broadcast it. And, um, and they just go through the scenarios. I mean, you don't have to identify, well, you know, it was, it was John person. Doe, right? But then that person, that could be a way to, to get to the, the bottom line, the goal, and, and protect people's anonymity and um, maybe get them to share more openly about it, think about their case differently. I think it's great. I love it. I think it could be a different yeah. way to deliver right. CLE in a right. way that is more meaningful. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've done exercises where it's basically like a Harvard Business Review case study, right? right? You're given that set of facts, and then you sit around a table with a bunch of people and talk through, like, well, what do you think about that? You know, like, it, there's, like, a moderated sure. discussion of it. And you take on different roles. You'll be the uh, family member or patient. Um, mm-hmm. Right. Oh, that's great. That'd be good for a classroom exercise, too. Okay. All right. Um, 
Well, I do have alternative pathways. I like that one the best. <laughs> um, but I do. Th I certainly think a health pathway without that pair of disciplinary action is probably something hot on your on your mind. Um, aging's been really interesting. This is my own area of research where. Um, people are just going to keep working later in life. We see it a lot in medicine, too, and there's lots of articles about doctors and surgeons working later, and they don't have the same um, age restrictions that you would for emergency services or pilots or other professions. So there's a JAMA article that's going to come out shortly on cognitive impairment screening, and it's where you look at your, your higher cognitive functions, your um, language skills, uh, memory, um, things that would relate very closely to the practice of law. And, um, and it goes back and forth on the benefits and harms of um, implementing these screenings. And then once, once someone, and it tends to be how they actually work is a, you have to do a series of tasks. And then based on how you do these series of tasks, you may be prone to early onset dementia or dementia. And they'll kind of diagnose you. And then based off that, you'll have additional testing done. But um, it's very controversial. Um, the, uh, but also, one out of three people over the age of 85 have some form of dementia. So it's an area to think about as we're working later in life. And we want to encourage working later in life um, to have what certain safeguards to consider. So I do not have a, an answer here. But I do think when you're thinking about alternative pathways and why some of these issues could have occurred, especially with record keeping or things related to um, just someone kind of working part time and maybe losing like some of their memory, especially short term memory. Um, that's a different issue than a disciplinary issue, especially if someone's been an outstanding lawyer for 40, 50 years. And this is just a later in life occurrence that we know is happening. It's a just demographic change. Sort of like a mistake prevention, right. or like issue prevention measure. Right, right, it's really right. really hard to do it. Right, right. And, all, and, I, and this is happening in medicine and other professions, but um, I love to flag it, and I think it should be, as you, I agree, we have some way to treat it differently. Um, and then, and then a, a type of <coughs> alternative dispute resolution or mediation might be helpful. Did you have a comment? Oh, on the, on the, the age thing, um, even for a driver's license, right after a certain age, right. you have to do it, um, you have to more, more re yeah, um, more frequently. Right. And I don't know how you would necessarily do that for lawyers or for, do for doctors, but that there's some sort of like, and if it's something where everybody has to do it based on what age they are, as opposed to somebody flagged you right. as having an issue, right. um, maybe that could be something, I don't know. I like that idea, yeah. Um, I mean maybe it's part of the renewal process if you're over the age of 70, there's an extra step or some, um, a, high, a, a flag, some kind of indicator. Uh, you're not you're not alone in not knowing how to, but I think it's important to start the conversation with it. And I'd be happy to share the the JAMA article when it comes out, um, saying like what they actually test for cognitive impairment, and and ultimately the the abstract was that they decided to not require it, um, but that was yellow. <laughs> that was vague. <laughs> it was very 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 conflicted as to what to do and when. Um, Oh, so I'll just, I'm sure, um, I know David started also talked about what he does with the medical profession and what we ultimately were doing with the Victoria Bar is the idea of the risk-based calculator. Uh, you can't really get to this point until you do some of the other work that we've already talked about in terms of getting a better handle on your data, which interventions seem to be more effective than others. But the bottom line is that it would enable a regulator, a lawyer, an employer to routinely monitor and check their risk levels. Um, and the idea is you would have this algorithm that would be either a mobile app or on the web, and, um, and it does this, it's sort of a decision, supports a decision support tool. So it says, well, you've received you know, so many complaints in the last, um, over your career, you have this likelihood of receiving so many more um, based off your demographics or age or uh, zip code, here are some interventions to consider, here are some targeted CLEs. It's supposed to be a very um, user-friendly, you probably partner with informatics to get it going, but um, at the end of the day, that's what the Victoria Bar really wanted. They wanted this thing, to, this product to take with them. And I, so I know David started talking about this quite a bit when he was here a few weeks ago, and I wanted to include it with our slides, sort of an endpoint goal. Um, but I think of, at the end of the day, um, my, my charge was to tell you what I did in Australia, which hopefully I successfully did. 
and uh, we'll share with you related papers, particularly regarding kind of this voluntary online self-assessment that um, is one of the things that came up. And I think you suggested some really fantastic things to think about in ways that I hadn't even thought about connecting to medicine with um, uh, the uh, action reviews post an event. That sounds very exciting and um, really rich uh, substance there. But um, that's kind of everything I got. And you had great ideas on your own, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. My pleasure. Really exciting. Uh, did I, do you feel like you understand what happened in Australia? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> It's terrific having a smaller group. It just it really yeah. like yeah. lends itself to our being able to talk and think and, and share ideas. And so let me suggest this. Um, this was terrific. Thank you very oh, much. Sure. And what I would, what I suggest is we take a brief break, um, and then come and come back refreshed, uh, and then open the floor to further comments, thoughts, questions. If you have the time to stay for another 20 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever it might be. Um, and then we can either break for lunch at that point if we have, if lunch is available L lunch or. Lunch is ready. Lunch is ready, lunch okay, is ready. but why don't, we, why don't we do that part we could, first? We could do it now and then we could like have a working lunch or uh, whatever, whatever works. I, 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 I'm monitoring times, I was looking, you have a yeah. flight at 2.30, the drive time to LAX is looking pretty good right now, traffic's pretty light, so it's <laughs> barely a half hour, so I, I think. Right. Well, I'd about like what to time try then should she comfortably leave? It uh, depends upon how comfortable you are with, with like getting to the airport. And w but okay. I think you've got, I, I would say you've got another hour, maybe a little less than another oh, hour, okay. maybe 45 minutes. All right. That's, uh, well, I trust you. I mean, um, so why don't we, I'll we'll stick around. We'll have a, a, a working lunch then. Is that? Do that? Is that sure. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. And uh, I just want to thank you uh, for, your, for your time and um, for your ideas. I really enjoyed this. Great. Yeah. And I, I got an email about where lunch is. It's in one of the conference rooms. Not, I, I don't think it's out in the hallway as we do with yeah, board meetings. I think, did you? Yeah. Okay, you think you can find your way to lunch? <laughs> okay. We're going to bring it back here. Yeah, we'll, we'll bring the lunches back here. But maybe give like 10 minutes of like uh, decompressed restrooms, whatever else you need to do, and then we'll reconvene in 10, maybe re reconvene right at noon? Why don't we say five of noon? Five of noon, okay. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. Keep things moving.
All right. Thank you, everyone. We're back um, together again to continue the discussion um, that we've had from uh, Taurus Flar. Uh, this is an opportunity to, uh, for us to ask questions and kick around ideas in the few minutes that she has before she has to leave. So, uh, Debbie, I think you had a comment that you would like to make on the record. One of the things I want to talk about is that we uh, what we also had a, s a study done. The state bar had a study, um, and we had it done by a gentleman out of I think Irvine, UC Irvine, who looked at disparities in um, discipline and who gets disciplined more <coughs> and why. And then with I think the Black Caucus actually asked us to sort of look at the, you know anecdotally this is what we're hearing. Would you look into it? And we we did and. That came out. What came out of that were solo practitioners for, for especially men of color, and um, they represented themselves when they when they were got into trouble, and that was part of the problem with things because, you know, they didn't they weren't able to hire anybody. And how, what can we do to help sort of mitigate some of that? And they had problems with like we were talking about the trust fund accounts, the client uh, accounts and stuff like that. So, I think that this is also woven in. To some of this, because I, I was going to ask you, because you had said you, you guys avoided race as one of your determining factors. I'm just curious what that what that was about. To define, I mean, yes, yeah, but you know, for, like, like for us, we are so diverse as a state. There's just right. no way. There's no, like no way. If you that would just be no. We just, we have to that we have to do everything through that lens because of who we are. It's just the numbers here just you know demand that. Well, from a university perspective, or researcher perspective, the more data, the better. And we really were interested in collecting that information. Uh, there was a, an operations administrative hurdle where they simply don't ask for that information on their, uh, their uh, registrations and renewals. So I, can, I, can, I get a sense that you have that information then when someone, if you ask their ethnicity or race for their, when they, uh, all your lawyers each time they, is that fairly recent, though? It, I'm sorry, I'm multitasking. Is what is what collecting fairly recent? Race. Collecting race data. No, we've collected it from admissions. So what's recent is that we've gotten better <coughs> data management skills, where we link um, the data that is given to us at admissions, um, which has a whole different, like, unique identifier because it's the admissions. They're not even licensed attorneys. They may not become licensed attorneys because they they may not pass the bar. But taking that data and then linking it to the uh, attorney data, which has a different unique identifier. So this is simply it's a silly technical issue, but with regard to linking those two data sets, okay. we've now also begun collecting, though, through the My State Bar profile. So where the attorneys go online to um, pay their dues, we now have a, a whole demographic section where we ask them to go through a series of questions, and we've modified those to bring those categories up to date. So, so simple things like you can select more than one, for mm -hmm. example, on your selection of race ethnicity. It's not, it's not like you know, you're, for, you're not forced into like, oh, I am this, but rather I am this actually and this as well. Right. So um, that's what's relatively recent. That's the major change that we've done on the demographic data collection. Right. So, <coughs> so in Australia, the, so if it inform the information would have to somehow be collected, which would have been a step to add, whereas you're in a different situation where it's part of admissions and you've already been working on it. And then um, it's so, I mean, as, as race relations are in every country, um, society, it's just, it was, um, there were immigration issues in Australia that are not unlike here with um, Southeast Asia that... Um, in India and in China, and it's a very, it's actually a, a fairly diverse, especially in um, Melbourne, where the major city in the state of Victoria, about four and, four and a half million people. And um, it is mostly Anglo, I would say, with English descent, as you might suspect, but um, race relations are challenging. And then it was very, it was something the information had never historically been collected. They didn't want to raise an issue where maybe there wasn't an issue. <laughs> but they're good. <laughs> so, so uh, I, I know, I know. And they had their other target priority areas that they, so it wasn't so much a no as more of a not yet, which is made a lot of how the decisions happen or didn't happen. Um, we were interested, too, on, um, like, just uh, law school practices, right, where they went, if they were out of state, when in state, just that transition. And there was just a general reluctance on their part to change their intake process. Um, 
beyond trying to get more information about the, the com complaining witness, but not so much on the lawyers and their jurisdiction. Um, in New Zealand, it's very sensitive with um, their indigenous relationship with the Maoris is uh, incredibly sensitive, um, but that would be quite striking, um, I think, for New Zealand. And even though they tend to be more forward-looking than I would say Australia about these issues, God, this is being recorded. <laughs> um, but it was, it's, just, it's just it's something where if you can't somehow get the information to build it into the intake period, intake section to get the data seemed to add this hurdle that wasn't a priority and that's what happened in Australia and it, it would have been it would be really great I hope that they reconsider going forward well first of all I want to really thank you again for a, a really terrific presentation it's interesting <coughs> in hearing from uh, you know, the medical side and then the public health side, and then even offline. Um, Dag and I were talking about uh, his wife, who's a, a commercial airline pilot for one of the major airlines. Uh, and in my experience in the aviation field, different professions uh, approach this issue of how to uh, try to minimize subpar performance, if you will. And that's what our discipline system is actually trying to do, which is to, by weeding out or by disciplining and, and you know, kind of whacking people over the head who've been, who have not performed up to par. <coughs> but other professions try to take a more, um, I wouldn't say holistic, but a, a more forward thinking and, and uh, interactive in some cases, uh, in a way in commercial uh, uh, flying, for instance, the pilots are encouraged to self-report so that there is a, com uh, a continuing database being collected of situations and, and that can be analyzed to determine where are things kind of becoming a little shaky or where do we need to improve. Um, and that requires obviously a culture of realizing that the most important thing is to prevent problems in the future, not to pinpoint the, you know, the somebody who didn't act, you know, who didn't perform as up to par, if you will, this time. Um, <clears throat> now, there are obviously sanctions for people who don't. I mean, you know, the airline pilot who goes through the security checkpoint, you know, under the influence is dealt with. But, uh, but a less minor uh, kind of thing is in the, the self-reporting is encouraged. That's just ex one example in one profession. And I think what at least I'm starting to, to realize is that it may be possible to change the culture of what we're doing now, which is to have a huge and very effective uh, discipline uh, prosecution uh, organization and maybe try to um, uh, lift people up uh, in a more positive way than simply relying on the, the discipline uh, aspect. So. I think there's a lot of food for thought here for the purpose of this committee, which is to determine whether this is an area that we should continue to look at. That's really the, the charter of this committee this time, as I recall <coughs> today, right? Yes. I, I waited until you'd just taken a bite so that you could be yes. sufficiently embarrassed. Yeah. Okay. Um, I did have a question, though. Uh, when you were going through a slide, five or six or eight back, whatever it was about in, in Australia, the interventions that were uh, imposed or, or, you know, provided, if you will. One was supervision um, and one was, uh, as I would call it, abatement of practice in certain areas. And those both seem like tools that we don't have. So if you could explain your understanding. First of all, was this something that was already in the toolkit of the regulators in Australia that they could assign a su supervising attorney to a, uh, another attorney for a period of time? And, and your understanding of how that works? And also the second one, how they abate uh, or preclude an attorney from acting in a particular practice area but presumably allowed to continue their practice in other areas? That seems like a more granular approach than what we're taking, which is you're either suspended or disbarred or, you know, whatever. So that'd be interesting. 
those are those are great questions and uh and those tools weren't weren't heavily utilized there'd have to be a um a misconduct to get to that point it wasn't a pro it wasn't a mm -hmm. um that'd be a finding misconduct to assign such a thing and they had um as part of their they had a pool of what they recognized as their um volunteer and more higher achieving lawyers that have volunteered to be super supervisors for this purpose. So that's how they, they already had a pool of people kind of ready and waiting to go. And again, it, a little different that it, it tends to be so centralized, like most people really did dominate in that one major city of Melbourne. But I imagine through technology today that it doesn't really matter where someone's located. There could be a way to have touch points. But they would have some kind of, almost like you would have with an externship in law school, where they would um, regularly meet with a supervising attorney. There would be um, a process by which uh, the, um, some type of um, issues that had been identified for why the misconduct may have occurred, that they were trying to work out with the process, like what they were putting in place. Um, there was some kind of like shadowing element that might occur where they would just sort of witness how this more experienced, I wouldn't say more experienced, it all varied in terms of levels and ages, but um, how this more competent individual handled issues um, that, that would be opportunity for the supervisee to witness. Um, so that's how it was, so, it had, so that's how it was assigned and it, and it was particularly useful if it was a case of that professional isolation that I mentioned, um, <coughs> where it came up a lot, so, so that would be the smaller provider, a smaller firm. Um, but it, they had their own uh, task. I don't want to call it a task force, but they had a committee that was part of the bar that oversaw the this group, which um, had been identified. Yeah, it was very informal, it, um, and I would—I don't—it wasn't like a heavily utilized tool in their toolbox, but it was something that um, had been used, and um, and I think really addressed that issue of professional isolation. Um, the the other question you raised was about the yeah yeah right. Right, right, right. Right, no, that's exactly right. So they had a term for this at the Victoria Bar called the Jack and Jill of all trades, or like a generalist that should no longer be a generalist. Or, um, and that was more common, as you might expect, among uh, smaller firms and more rural areas that felt obligated to take on. And this is not different from medicine either. That's why telemedicine is so popular, um, which is another maybe avenue to think about when trying to get an expert or specialist to intervene <laughs> from another profession. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> they would restrict the practice, and they would, and they, it was through a, a part of the order that came from our tribunal um, that said you could only, um, you know, if this was an area where you have consistently been found to have so many complaints or this um, act occurred where uh, maybe there's an immigration issue, for example, you can no longer, that's not your main area of law. We recommend that you don't practice within it until you show us some level of competency through a CLE or some type of um, restriction, right? Um, uh, the other type it came up with more in like commercial transactions and property where they would be restricted from those types of more complicated cases if they didn't have experience with it. The other area we saw it was property. Um, I hope I'm answering your questions. I'm trying to think about the specific scenarios that it came up with. And I guess part of the, the, what they really tried to wrap their whole hands around was just how to be more systematic with when to decide which tool to use for which lawyer and then how effective could it be. And they didn't have real, they really wanted to get a better handle on which interventions could change behavior for the better going forward, limit harm to the public until there was proper training. But it was this holistic look, as you alluded in, in the, your intro about how to give people the resources and tools they need um, where, the, where the disciplinary action aligns with it, with it right? Another uh, 
area that's not necessarily directly related to this, but tangentially. Uh, we, as a state bar, are looking at the paraprofessional um, introduction of para, uh, paraprofessionals to provide not just uh, legal services but legal advice. Uh, <clears throat> that's something that's not we're not at the threshold of, but we do we will be look, looking at that in the future. Um, and that's being introduced in, or has been in Washington and Utah and Arizona, as I understand it. Uh, does Australia have uh, similar programs to that? And if so, did you look at the uh, uh, performance of those folks uh, as part of your study, or are you aware of, of how that all works? That's a, that is such a great question, something that I, I often think about because I oversee our health law program for our Master's of Legal Studies. Because often what happens in the healthcare world is you'll have a compliance officer, for example, compliance office, for example, as part of Banner Health, Jamie Health, a large entity, and you'll have one person out of 30 that has a JD and the rest have really no legal training whatsoever, but they're constantly doing contrast, risk management, compliance work. So it's very, very real in the healthcare space where you have people practicing law who aren't lawyers, essentially. And uh, so we've developed at U of A, in addition to the program you've heard about, Innovation for Justice, um, we also have graduate certificates in health law that are designed, and we have JDs in them as well, but they're really designed for clinicians and entrepreneurs, uh, policy folks, the um, engineers, you wouldn't believe <laughs> the range of people and ages and backgrounds I have in these courses. And, and it's because they want to understand the, uh, the basic statutes, the HIPAA, Stark, they want to get a, a sense of um, the bigger picture, like how these rules came to be, um, and then how to comply with them. And so that's just one example of what you've been describing, this phenomenon of what, what we're seeing, where because a lot of these companies aren't requiring the positions to have JDs, maybe it's preferred but not required, and they certainly don't have to take a state bar. Uh, so it's a it's a huge issue in the healthcare space, and um, in Australia, just an interesting side note: what's happening there is you could be a, a solicitor and a lawyer there for with your undergraduate degree, and only recently, in the last I don't know ten years or so, they introduced graduate degrees in law, and so now you have this clash between <laughs> the JD prepared lawyers or solicitors and the undergrad prepared lawyers. And it's, it's just a broader change in how they're delivering education that is sort of not unlike what we're facing at a different range, right? Because we're really talking about just most of these people have bachelors, maybe they have some kind of certificate or something, um, but they're delivering legal advice and training. So I think, I think those types of programs that you're familiar with that you mentioned in Washington, Utah, and Arizona, I think our types of, and it's, and it's the Master of Legal Studies, Masters of Jurisprudence, they all have different names. I mean, they're kind of all getting to that end goal of how to provide some kind of legal training for someone who doesn't plan to be a lawyer. And then from a regulatory perspective, is there any kind of equivalent, um, you know, a, a, what in, the, in law schools were regulated by um, ALS. But what would what what could possibly regulate or accredit these different types of master's degrees? Because there really isn't, really isn't anything to my knowledge, and they vary. Um, yeah, it's definitely a, it's st certainly a trend. Yeah. You know, in Sacramento, I think George has a master's degree in uh, in law, and it's a you know it's just a regular um, law school, but they also do this master's, and it's. I think the emphasis is on um, regulatory, um, looking at uh, regulatory, doing that. And a lot of people are taking it, so I don't know. They're actually being fairly successful with it. But I don't think are subject to state bar regulation, right? I mean, it's like these people are participating in the provision of legal services, but there's no regulation of sort of what that what goes into that certification. I mean, like UCLA, yeah, UCLA is always like talking about, hey, come get our paralegal cert certificate. Um, we don't know what goes into that curriculum. Well, Tara has about five minutes before she has to start uh, packing up to make her ride back out to the airport. So I just want to 
see if there are any other questions or comments or anything in the next few minutes for her so we don't unintentionally well you, <laughs> okay it's it's a little bit off but if you want to make a public comment to this committee in a little while you can Go ahead. Yes. Sorry. Well, there's a trend happening at law school as it might be happening with regulators of lawyers. It's, it's maybe interesting to mention it's this whole this, this, this um, <coughs> disruption of law schools. And one of them is the, that many law schools now have these master's, um, master jurisprudence, master le legal studies programs. And uh, and they're just, you know, some of it is dealing with um, the ebb and flow of the JD program. Um, some of it's a game that they're playing with JD, I shouldn't call it a game, <laughs> with the, the JD rankings, um, the U.S. News and World Report, um, a way to just get extra revenue, diversify revenue, um, the, the whole online, how we deliver our courses online um, and compared to face-to-face, -to -face, and that's upshot dramatically. Now you can deliver up to 15 credits, I believe, online. So the th um, so what is it, third year anywhere is becoming a, a real thing for more and more law schools. So it should just be interesting to think about what's happening, and I'm sure you do, it's probably a very naive comment I'm even making to this committee, but what's happening at law schools and how that's changing regulation, legal profession in general, because what we're seeing at my end, you're going to see five years from now. And, um, and it, seems, it seems like they're consolidating and diversifying in very different ways than, uh, than I've ever seen in my short time. Well, I wouldn't make the assumption that this, uh, the, the folks on this committee are as w aware of that as, as you are, so that's a good comment for us. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Any other comments or questions or anything? Do you Before we send her on her way to LAX and <laughs> <laughs> the security lines and so forth. Well, thank you again very much. This has been most helpful, and we really appreciate your coming here and talking with us and it's been terrific. Thank you. Thank you.
just uh, my few minutes on sure. this. Sure. Because we're, you know, video for that. You can stay there. We are going to go out of order here. Uh, a member of the public has arrived who was not here when we first called for public comment. He'd like to make a, uh, a short uh, comment to this committee, which I have allowed. And um, so please, when you start, just state your name and uh, uh, limit your comments to a couple of minutes, please. Okay. Thank you, sir. Hello. Uh, <coughs> thank you for having me today here. And I want to thank this honorable committee for hearing me. And uh, I also want to say that I'm impressed with the work that you guys have done. And I want to thank you on behalf of the people of California. And this is one of the best uh, meetings I've ever been in because you guys were open, you were nice, and you are articulate. And we could follow you. And I like your ideas and your logic and your proceedings. It was really easy for me to take your information. Now, let me tell you who I am. My name is James Bloom. I'm in the United States Marine Corps Honorable Discharge. I'm also a former police officer. And what we're doing now is we're incorporating the bar's teachings with judicial performance with the judges. And we're incorporating them also with the courts. And what we're trying to do is get a, an all around process so we could, you know, better understand how this judiciary branch of government will fit in. And what we do is we take your, you know, task force and all your ideas, we try and incorporate it in the military, help all the military, you know, for example, personnel. We do a couple unofficial, you know, divorces, but we're not practicing law. We just go to the bar and we also go to a legal law library. And here's the conflict I'm having, and I'm just kind of gonna point this out with you. And I wanna do this public comment to you guys to put this forward to see if you could see where we're coming from. The bar gave us classes and I even paid for them. So I got it down with a receipt from the, excuse me, the public library. And they give the legal, it's called pro bono week. And I don't know if you're aware of that, where they give us classes. So we use what we learn there. And I was just wondering, uh, and then you got those new, uh, uh, not licensed stuff, but you call them paraprofessionals. I was wondering if I fall into it because I work with the chaplain's office in the United States Marine Corps and also with JAG. And I'm also a former police officer. So I also incorporate the criminal laws in there and we try and get as many Marines, Army and Navy and Air Force people that we can like do their divorces from all the way from you know, civil to criminal and get them off. And we're doing pretty good, <laughs> pretty good about that. But I was just wondering, you know, because of your information and the output you guys gave us here today, you, you, you help us, you help everybody. You help us in the civil, the criminal, the military, the civilian. And I wanna thank you for uh, sharing your information here with us today and where you're going with it. And uh, I just wanna say, you know, thank you for you know, letting us sit in here today and learn your methodologies and your practices. It's just really incredible the work you guys do here today. I can't even begin to articulate or explain how valuable your information here was that we could even turn it into a resource. And I wanna thank you for your, your work and your honorable service uh, to the military and the people of California. And I just wanna let you know, thank you so much, okay? Thank you. That's it, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, all right, Dag. So it was at the conclusion of our meeting in San Francisco about a month ago that um, Jose was kind enough to suggest that I produce a report, a draft report, so that we could make sure that we're moving forward. And I think it's a great idea, um, but Donna was kind enough to support me <laughs> in saying, maybe not a report, maybe an outline. Um, so what I've handed out is an outline. It's, it's very skeletal, um, and uh, I, in certain ways, uh, I think, kind of obvious, I mean, we need to make recommendations. So the final section would be recommendations. Um, one always needs to introduce the topic. So it introduces the topic, provides a little bit of history about where we've been and um, what the previous reports look like. But then what I was, uh, the, the areas that I think we would wanna focus on would really be um, two, three, and four, Roman, <coughs> excuse me, Roman two, three, and four. <coughs> and, um, uh, again, there's a certain sort of self-evident quality to it. I, if we're going to write a report about risk-based regulation, we want to define what that is and, and provide, uh, you know, a, a substantial amount of information regarding, you know, what is it, 
uh, how does it differ, differ, differ from traditional uh, regulatory models? I, I see traditional regulatory models referred to sometimes as command and control. Um, and why does it matter for public safety and to the regulator? And then based on that, I saw uh, Roman three as being the opportunity to, um, for lack of a better word, plagiarize um, or borrow. I will borrow heavily from um, the presentations that we've gotten to date, and I will confirm with professors Studdard and um, uh, Sklar that um, what I've done in terms of transcribing the work that they've done and really taking their presentations and fleshing them out and probably <laughs> synthesizing a little bit and trying to say, you know, here's what we learned about uh, risk-based regulation in the medical field. Here's what we learned about risk-based regulation based on a study of Australia, and bring those two together. Um, and then really the, the full synthesis would be uh, four, uh, Roman four, where we would say, okay, now based on those lessons, how do we really apply that to California? So what are the commonalities and differences? I think, and I heard today some interesting issues with regard to um, sort of the, the level of regulation, say, in the medical field where the hospital or the, the care provider is the regulated entity and has a real interest in and the capacity to provide some oversight and risk mitigation. Whereas in the, you know, this issue that came up when we were looking at <laughs> options, it came up first when we were looking at options for um, increasing the fee, um, it became clear we don't regulate um, entities, we regulate individuals. And so um, there are definitely issues that we would want to like, bring <coughs> bring into the conversation in, in number four regarding like, what have we learned, what have we learned that's effective, what are the opportunities and the obstacles to applying those lessons in the California context. Um, and then in terms of the regulations, although, I, uh, excuse me, the recommendations in five, what I imagine is is that we're we're probably, uh, I imagine laying out some potential for pilot tests that we might conduct. Um, we're already engaged in some, some modest discussions about pilot testing in OCTC related to, uh, our first one is gonna go out um, uh, starting this month where we're looking at the question of the very time consuming phone calls that OCTC makes to complaining witnesses and their effort to determine like where can we skip the phone call? Where is, wh what are the cases where maybe we can save a little bit of time and not make the phone call? And so we're, we're conducting a random experiment where we're, we're asking att attorneys to um, select half of the cases based on, on the last digit, whether it's odd or even, of the, of the um, complaint. And half of those are not gonna get a phone call and half of them are, are gonna get the phone call the way that they've normally been doing it. And in about three months, we think we'll have enough data from our complaining witness survey to look at the results and say, is there any difference at all in terms of how complaining witnesses assess their experience of the state bar um, regarding uh, uh, their sense of procedural justice? If, is there any di difference there by not having gotten the phone call? And if there's not, then that gives us a more sort of um, sub substantive foundation for how we make a decision about which cases get the phone call or not, then OCTC can focus on, okay, if, if the complaining witness issues are, are off the table, let's focus on whether it's the vulnerable victim cases or the, uh, the um, there's a, what are the matters, uh, major matters, major cases, major cases where um, there are cases that have a significant, potential significant impact, the high publicity, um, uh, major stakeholders involved in the cases that we want to uh, make the phone calls to. So. I think this, this type of nudging, which is increasingly, you see it, um, it's, it's grown up a lot around big data and the, like, because of the rise of the internet, the way that um, small manipulations in user experience are, are uh, used as like mini experiments to then modify um, the way that the work is done. I, I hope that we can engage in this kind of work in the research shop at the, at the state bar and, and start seeing where we can make a difference. Well, um, first of all, I think the outline is, is overall pretty good. Um, I think obviously the uh, areas that are gonna take the most f work and uh, attention are 4B, one and two, uh, opportunities and challenges. I have a preliminary question that I don't have firmly in my mind, or the answer to which I don't have firmly in my mind, and 
maybe Donna, you can help me with this and uh, others. I'm, I don't know, I, I guess my question is how far should this particular government and the task force committee take this particular issue? In other words, at the very minimum, this committee was formed to identify, yeah, to, to fulfill the requirements of the, you know, the statutory uh, requirements of this committee, I mean of, of the government task force committee that, that has to re produce a report every three years. I mean at the very minimum we could produce a report saying this is, we've investigated this, this seems like a fruitful area of, uh, of opportunity and we recommend that it be pursued. Uh, and then we submit that to the legislature and the other stakeholders and we have conversations and we see if there is uh, support for moving forward and then either perhaps a, a, another GTF uh, pursues it, or in the interim we, having, you know, potentially positive responses, we form a separate committee to, to do that. Uh, or we could make it a uh, part of the uh, strategic plan uh, this coming year. Or we could continue with this committee and drill further down, produce a report, and then and continue with this committee. I'm not sure of the best structure and that's what I'm, I'm wondering, uh, kind of how limited or how expansive do we want to make our charge for this committee in this topic? So I, I think you're right, Ellen, you've got, you've got a, a, a handful of options that are available to you, um, probably an innumerable number of options that are available to you. Um, but I, I think what may make the most sense is sort of laying, laying this out um, in, uh, in the report of sort of the, the things that we've studied and the possible uh, directions that this could take us in um, and committing that this is something that the board will will incorporate into uh, its processes going its strategic planning process going forward it will incorporate even in as dag was talking about this um, the process for um, ensuring procedural fa fairness with complaining witnesses right just um, to start thinking about some of the the, the things that are more easily incorporated um, with what we are already doing today, right, to incorporate some of these principles. We'll need, to, we'll need to think more broadly and probably the strategic planning session next year is the way to do it if we are looking at some of these more, um, uh, really sort of more forward thinking and novel approaches, whether we're talking about providing some um, um, sort of regulation or at least assessment of the implication of entities as opposed to the individuals. If we're looking at, um, and I know Highland, you wanted to get back to this issue, looking at sort of different, um, different options for discipline um, that are intended to get even sort of more directly at the risk uh, that is posed by the, the particular individual. Um, so I think it's a matter of committing as part of the report that this is, you know, this has sort of opened our eyes to um, uh, some really sort of interesting approaches to dealing with, um, with, comp with complaints and that this is something that we'll be incorporating into our, our sort of current processes to the extent possible and that we'll be devoting some real energy to it um, going forward starting most likely with the strategic planning session. Any reaction to that from the members? For me, I think some of the low hanging fruit though I think we can do even before that, um, I know you were talking about um, sending out some sort of guidelines for help for people that are maybe becoming solo practitioners or something like that. I, I think that there, in fact, there's something else you mentioned earlier today that you were going to implement soon that um, just sort of sort of moving the ball just a little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we have to wait for the big pronouncements and the big huge things that, that can happen. But oh, I think the self, I mean, they're doing the self-assessment, maybe even the self-assessment tools. I don't know if that would be something we could do earlier than waiting until we um, have a task force or, you know. Yeah, I think we could go to like recommending yeah. that those, these are things that are easier to easier, implement yeah. or let we can implement sooner rather than later mm -hmm. and just come out with that. And just come out with that. I think, I, so it looks like we're doing something and not just, yep. not just dumped a report like kicking and, the can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, then, you know, six months from now, 
you know, we'll, we'll dig yeah. into it a little bit further. Yeah, and that's, that's what I was trying to get at in artfully <laughs> um, when I was talking about sort of rolling into some of our current processes and oh, sort yeah. of our current thinking <coughs> about, about, you know, the, what the work that DAG is doing. Um, we, f we probably are um, at best going to be, you know, the end of the year before we start collecting um, the data on um, firm size, so we won't be able to do that proactively, but we are, we've got, you know, we, we are working toward that, um, the self-assessment. We will um, get the direction from the board in May on the areas to go forward with, and then we can begin the, the development of that self-assessment tool. So all of those things that I think that we are sort of thinking about already, the low-hanging fruit, if you will, <coughs> um, making sure that as we're thinking about all of these innovative things that we've been working on, that we have this sort of analysis going through our head and we're, and we're not sort of sticking to just the old ways of doing things. Because I also think this also develops some, some, um, some of the um, information you need to go forward to actually doing the studies. If you want to do something down the road, collecting some of that data now, doing the data collection now that we think may be, ne may be needed in the future, I think is um, not a bad idea. Yeah, I was, <clears throat> I was going to say, I think that, so we're going to hear some more about this, although from a slightly different angle, at the July board meeting because Professor Chris Robertson, who um, did the follow-up for the planning session on the study of disparities in the discipline system, we're continuing to communicate with him, we're working with him, and one of the issues that was raised by um, Professor Sklar had to do with decision matrices, like that, that at the point of decision that there are clearly articulated documented practices with regard to how is this assessed and what does that mean in terms of the intervention. And that was one, th one of the things we were just on the phone with Professor Robertson talking about um, yesterday, the day before, um, and working with OCTC to establish like what are, what are your decision rules and how are they applied and how do people know what the rule is that you apply to different situations. So even starting there, I mean, we'll be hearing about these things coming at, at different angles. The other, the other component of this that um, we're already working on that I think it, maybe this would be helpful for is we've been struggling a bit with trying to figure out what to do with recidivism data. It's just, it, it, do we set a target on it? I, I don't know that people <coughs> normally set targets on recidivism data. We have it as a measure that we present to the uh, Regulation and Discipline Committee. But, you know, other than looking at it and saying, okay, well, there's, there's, there's recidivism data, what do you do with it? I, th I think that some of these lower level interventions that Professor Sklar was talking about with regard to say like a resource letter and maybe, you know, what exactly is it that you're communicating in a resource letter? How exactly are you communicating it? Uh, could you take a more assertive approach um, in terms of saying, you know, we would like for you to be assessed or we would like you to assess yourself? W what are the other modalities that might then um, create a different outcome and I think we're, we have the ability to measure what those outcomes are. It might take a while in terms of recidivism itself, but certainly, um, you know, we have the, the data capacity to track what the impact would be of some of these changes that we could make. So. I, I feel like the Office of Research and Institutional Accountability is going to become like a little laboratory. On, and I think it would be very exciting because I think the Board of Trustees then gets to, you all get to put on your lab coats and and like look at the petri dishes and say, look what's growing over there. So. Yeah, I, it might be, and I'm just thinking out loud here. <coughs> it might be that there would be either a section or a uh, part of your analysis under four, probably, about this is taken, I don't know, be the words you would use, but taken to this logical end or the extreme. These are, this is the way we could uh, potentially change the culture and, and uh, the way we do, the way we approach discipline. Um, and these would have a number of these opportunities. This is what's been happening in other uh, professions. And these are the, these are the benefits that we could see potentially occurring. These are, the, these are the issues that we'd have to work through, and there might be 10 or 20 of them. I don't know. We've, we've identified a number of them already. And, and then a third part would be we believe that this is sufficiently uh, impactful and important that we should begin at least laying the groundwork for further 
collection of data and and uh, further discussion. So these are the these are the uh, we call them in this meeting low hanging fruit. But these are the initial steps that we could take to uh, begin laying the found, laying the groundwork for potential future development in this area. And I think it's always important to kind of not get ahead of our skis in terms of where we're going, which is always, you know, the, the tendency of getting a lot of people together and really getting in excited about something, and I think that's great, but I think we need to um, probably continue the momentum and, and, and do that, but be clear that we are, we are laying the groundwork for the potential of uh, for more far-reaching changes. I think we should, ta in talking about some of these changes and some of the things that are done in other contexts, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that it would reflect a major change in the way we do things and a major cultural change, and that it would require a lot of analysis and discussion. And we're just, you know, right now we're floating it and discussing it as, or you know, presenting it as a as a way also to sort of encourage really robust discussion. Indeed. Indeed, yeah. and and so that we're not suggesting like, hey, this is what we're, what we're aiming this. to get yeah. towards. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to put this out for public comment uh, yeah. as a recommendation. You know. I think we should be very careful how we say it. I.e., duh. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's, uh, it's, it's also right. The, if we were going to start regulating other entities or providing oh, yeah. these, you know, courses, or there's a question of resources, um, right. staff resources, the the actual uh, funds to be able to do it. Right? There's a there are a lot of things that would stand in the way that would have to be part of this. Yeah, and I mean, that's a good point. I mean, if, if you were hypothetically in, in two or three years making a transition from one to the other, you would have your existing system in place and running at the same cost level in those years' dollars, and you would still you would be spending money on implementing the new changes so there would be overlaps, whether you've got a budgetary issue, if nothing else, among many others. At some point, the whole discussion needs to have more stakeholders at the table than us. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that's another, that was, thank you, but that was another <laughs> thought I had in, in terms of, have a, a wider audience, yeah, this committee shouldn't be the one who would be driving that kind of uh, more fundamental and, and comprehensive change alone. Yeah. All right, any other thoughts? Jose, no? Yeah. Juan? Okay. Dave, does that give you enough to do between now and this evening? <laughs> um, we <laughs> we will need to set. Well, I don't I don't know that we need another meeting. Um, I mean, what was discussed at the um, last right. meeting was that we really had time to do the last meeting, do this meeting in terms of our inc information gathering phase, and that by early April we should be finalizing a draft because the report itself goes to um, the legislature in mid-May. When do you think you would have your draft based on this? Early April. I, I, I late March, maybe, but I, I just – It's board important to get it good. Yeah, so board meeting is um, next Thursday, so th uh, that's when I'm going to turn my attention to that. ADR is coming up as well. But it, So can I float an idea? I don't want to make your job harder, but what I'm going to float will make your job harder. <laughs> Um, as long as it makes the work product better, that's okay. <laughs> um, if we talk about in Section 3, risk-based regulation in medicine, we talk about the Australian legal system, I think we have a lot of lessons to learn from the current internal compliance and auditing function that is done by insurance companies for mm -hmm. law firms. There's mm -hmm. a really – rather than reinvent the wheel and, yeah. you know, look at Australia or look at medicine, there's like an existing – I have two binders this big of – checklists and procedures and best practices. I love it. That's I right. No, I think this is that – that's exactly what I'm looking for. And I think yeah, that – Yeah, but you've got two binders. You I, I, <laughs> no, I, I – because I think that that helps – you know, this is this is pretty thin. This was intentionally yeah. thin just because I'm trying to, like, lay out the skeleton. But I think putting this There's kind of – so much information that's already been developed and processes and systems. And then this dovetails with um, what Alan raised earlier about how the – discipline that we impose, you know, suspension or debarment, it's such a blunt instrument. Another way to look at it could be to look at ways in which entities, whether it's law firms or the government or whatever, deals with problem situations in a way that mitigates risk going forward. So it could mean, for example, 
if you have a partner or a lawyer for whom you have some concerns about impairment or you have some concerns about lack of expertise in a certain area that they're having a stretch to engage in, you make sure that they work with someone else. Right? You say, continue to practice, but just as a safeguard, we're going to make you partner with this other person who has a lot more expertise in this. And, you know, that's a sort of risk mitigation um, thing that could be done. That is not just you're suspended and then once your suspension is over, come back to work. Like, there could be something <laughs> else that's done, right, to reduce the risk. Yeah, I, I thought, I, yeah, uh, and, and some of the things that came out of Australia, a couple of those mm -hmm. uh, interventions, yeah. uh, bear some thought, whether they would work here or not, whether they could be scaled up, mm -hmm. whether uh, teleconferencing tele <laughs> would, would uh, you know, help uh, achieve that or not. All those things. Trick someone from a certain thing that they're really yeah. bad at doing, but allow them to do the stuff they're right. good at doing. Another thing like right. that, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to be I'm going to be following up with you to get um, data okay. finders. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the general timeline then is late March, early April. You'll have a draft based on this outline and all the information we've gathered today and previously. Uh, you will uh, disseminate it to the committee members, and we'll all take a look at it and provide you our comments, and then you'll try to come up with some kind of mishmash, um, refined through a very small filter so that it comes out beautiful puree at the other end. And <laughs> you, you, your, your metaphors are really just I'm bouncing all over the place, but it's, <laughs> it's afternoon and I'm old, so I start to get a little bit, you know, lost. Smooth puree. Um, the puree report, yes. All right, so. Um, okay, no, I, um. And then should we um, reserve a potential date for a meeting in case we need a face-to-face -face or just do that by telecommunication or, or in, hopefully we don't need it, but. I, I suspect that um, when I circulate a draft, you will either <laughs> think, oh my God, we need to meet, <laughs> or you'll think, Okay, we can we can put this thing to bed with, and if we need to meet with a conference call. Okay. Um, All right. So that would be my recommendation. Okay. And this remind me, this has to be submitted by May fifteenth. May fifteenth. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's the ADR. The ADR is in April. Right? April thirtieth is the ADR. We're gonna have it, but we're gonna be. In fact, while I'm, uh, we're gonna be soliciting trustees for a. a date and time for a, a conference call to review the ADR in the middle of April. We haven't sent that out yet, but that's okay. look for it and it coming to an inbox near you soon. Okay. All right. Well, Dag, thanks very much for your work. and it's a great and conversation. Yeah. I, I great you. You, and, you, and you've got two really fine people to present. Um, that was terrific. And she's all like excited. Yeah. She was. Uh, yeah. She, so she's. Yeah. She's sitting at the bar at the hotel last night. For for for, for nostalgia's sake, I went to the. Uh, okay. Let's let's do this. Let's go off the record. We're through with the meeting. Thank you very much.